they were like, we got three phone calls today from labels. And I was like, yeah, well, I told you. And they're like, dude, can you handle this? Can you like manage us? And right there on the spot in Berkeley at, 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 thing, at the Omen, I became the Explosions Manager. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Before we start, if you want to support the podcast, you can go to This Was... Wait, no. You can go to patreon.com slash thiswasthescene. You can sign up for a dollar a month, or you can go to thiswasthescene.com, and you can Venmo some money or a lot of money, because that's a really cool thing to do. Big Wheel Recreation was an independent record label based in Boston, Massachusetts. It was formed in the fall of 94 by Rama Mayo and Dickie Cummings. Started as a hobby, Big Wheel became a fully functioning record label in 99. The label took a hiatus from releasing records sometime in 2004 until September 23rd, 2015, when it released an audiobook version of Hyena, 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 I don't know how to say this, by June Angelini. Thank you, Wikipedia, for writing all of that for me. So the bands that you might recognize are 454, Big Block, Aspera, At the Drive-In, Braid, Cancer Conspiracy, Cast Iron Hike, Damn Personals, The Don't Tells, Fast Break, Get High, The Hives, Hot Rod Circuit, International Joint, yeah, International Noise Conspiracy. I can't say that. International Noise Conspiracy. Jebediah, Jejun, Jejun, Jimmy at World. Oh, let's see. Lazy Kane, No Knife, Piebald, obviously, River City High, Sunshine, Ten Yard Fight, Totally Travis, and so forth. So and others. Yeah. Thank you, Casey Iodine, Iodine Records, Episode 134. If you want to hear what he had to say. Thank you, Casey, for connecting me to Rama. You are a, a good, good person. But yeah, so I got Rama on the Skype, and this is what we talk about. John Cheese, being business partners with Gary V, New Bedford Fest, Cast Iron Hike, Max Bemis, putting out the Jimmy at World split with Jejun, The Explosion, Piebald, River City High, and a ton more. There's a lot of really good shit in this interview, so um, I'm excited for you to hear all the stories that Rama's telling, because it's fucking great. Lastly, I'll be at Fest in October if all things work out with this Delta shit. So if you have any way for me to get backstage at any of the shows, that'd be awesome. Uh, just figure out how to throw it out there. So you can just email this was the scene at gmail.com. Or if you see me, I'll be walking around probably just giving out stickers and buttons. I'm going to get some swag to give out while I'm down there. But if not, that's totally cool. I figured, yeah, fuck it, why not? Feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some punk rock nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. Just before we start talking about th this whole thing, focuses on the late '90s, early 2000s scene, because I grew up in Jersey, played in a band there, and I that's where my that's where I got involved. And this thing started a couple of years ago, just going back and starting with New Jersey, and just solely focused on that. And then I wanted to talk to the labels and the bands and producers and roadies and like everyone who all influ influenced us and what their viewpoint was. Yeah, the John Cheese interview. I just like you had me at that when I looked at your thing, so you're good. Oh, that's awesome. Wait, so before I yeah, okay, so I'm gonna ask you another question. But um, did you know? Well, I guess you, obviously you knew John because he was of course. The what do you mean? Yeah, of course. Like, what do you? Yeah, obviously. Yeah, John was like our family. We like vacation together, like and like hang out on the weekends and do tour. Yeah, he's <clears throat> one of the most interesting people I've ever met. I could talk. The whole thing could just be about him. Did you know about his water bottle that he um. He like tried to carry with him for like a year or whatever. Do you know about the water bottle at all or no? No, tell me about this. So he just had like a water bottle that uh, he like didn't, he just like, had as a mission to keep it and like keep refilling it. We were at a big festival and he, he tried to like sneak it in, but they wouldn't let him because it was like a big water bottle. It was like a, it was the whole amazing, I don't know, fucking experience. <laughs> just him like, the dedication to such a just a, a random thing, you know, that he set his mind to. Now that I think about it, I've had a clean canteen for over, uh, I think about 13 years now, and I only drink water. Yeah, he there. invented it. He invented the thing you're talking about, probably, you know? <laughs> like, uh, yeah. But yeah, no, sure, of course, Cheese was incredible. You know, like, I, I probably, I don't remember exactly who I met him from, but I would imagine through like Brian Sheffield and Jeremy and Claire, when I think they lived together and I think they were roommates in, in Boston. But um, I don't know if you've ever interviewed Jeremy or Claire or uh, Brian Sheffield, but you should definitely 
put them on your uh, on your list. Yeah, and their I, names their know. their names are come up with Jeremy and Claire. Jeremy and Claire Weiss. Sorry, day nineteen. Uh, so yeah, Jeremy and Claire Weiss. They shot like every. So Brian Sheffield or Jeremy and Claire Weiss that are married now. They were dating then. Shot everything. They shot all the covers, all the all the in things, all the posters, all the live photos that you've seen of like Pieball going crazy or the cover of We Are the Only Friends That We Have. This was those guys, you know, and girls, you know, and they were fucking still are today huge photographers. Unbelievable now. Now it's now they're getting like what you could get it literally, literally by like a super nice car for on a day rate. Wow. Jeez. You know, yeah, yeah, like they they like buy houses and stuff with their with their photography money. You know what I mean? Yeah, but they you know they do if they they shoot for Harley Davidson, Nike, and the biggest. If you look at Brian Sheffield's website or Jeremy and Claire, it's called Day D A Y, but Day Nineteen. If you look at those sites, it's like the hugest commercial shit of all time. But then you're like, dude, that's Hot Rod Circuit mixed in there what's going on or that's pie ball or that's what up blah 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 oh my god i'm totally right yeah that. but I, that's why i think i think that's how i met cheese and i think they were living together because cheese is from jersey as well obviously right or no yeah 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 so 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 that's their whole thing is jersey like that they rep it they moved back there they, they like rep it so hard yeah john is a realtor in maywood new jersey and oh yeah you should listen to his interview it's really funny i saw the i saw the i, I watched the he has that band that played at like a garage sale or yes. something outside, like in the parking lot. It was amazing. He has a super funny name. I forget what it is, but Rights of Spring or something like that. Rights of Springfield. Yeah. <laughs> Ripping off Rights of Spring. <laughs> Dude, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, thank God, right? Like, I don't believe in God, God, I guess, but like, thank, like, thank you so much for like the John Cheeses of the world, right? It's like, who would do that? Who would put that much effort into not going, oh, I want this has to be profitable and he started a band just to, to do that fun thing. I miss all those people. I talked to some of them, but uh, but I miss like hanging out with them. Well, this is so the first question I had because I was doing some research, and I'm gonna geek out for a second, which is the, the for, so where you are now and what you do and all the things you've done. It just it's awesome. I love how everyone always looks back back to that scene, and it's such a giant place in their heart still like it, it won't go away it's it's you know like you said oh, no, the, the couple doing those photography and they've got hot rod circuit in mixed with all these like huge corporate you know or just giant jobs that they got and it's like such a part of us but i'm, I'm so fascinated because i was i didn't realize this i didn't know that i read something that said gary v was one of your business partners for the venture you're doing right now and but it was like a list it looked like it was a list of business partners though or they is a whole list of investors and he is literally just the two of you partnered no gary and i are partners on a company called green street and green street is essentially like a record label literally but for weed and you can't download weed and that's what we've been doing we started as an advertising agency just doing service work for for clients like 10 years ago and then we focused on cannabis for the last eight years partner and i started it eight years ago and he's an attorney his name's joshua shelton and Josh uh, came to me after we worked on a big cannabis client together. And he said, dude, we've got to start an agency dedicated just to cannabis. I'll do the compliance, make sure everything's legit. You know, you do like the marketing and branding. And I think it will be huge. We just got to like do it for a long time and get in early. And it's funny because you brought it up because the exact same feeling I got from like Jim Adkins or, or Max from Say Anything or, or Travis or or, you know, like, I mean, like I could name off Anthony Rosamondo. I could name off so many people. The same feeling I got from like those men and women, Airbnb, like from J. June, like the same feeling I got from them that I want to work with them, like in their music careers is the feeling I got from the cannabis men and women. And I'm like, holy shit, like if I can just do this right, there's no indie labels versus major labels yet in cannabis. I can be the major label in cannabis. So that's what I'm doing now. I feel like I'm building like maybe like the universal kind of, of, of cannabis. And I started eight years ago with Josh. Four years ago, we sold half the company to Gary. Wow. Yeah. And he's even more amazing off camera than he is on. He is the craziest workaholic I've ever seen. So inspiring. I don't know if you've ever seen, you've seen Kill Bill? Yeah. 
the movie, you know, like the scene where like she goes and she trains with the dude with the crazy mustache and he like jumps on top of the sword and stuff. Yep, yeah. That's Gary. And I'm like the girl with the sword or whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> like he is so many levels ahead of me that like, I don't think I'll ever get there. Like, honestly, I don't think I ever could, but I get to work with him daily. He's so involved. We text every week. You know what I mean? Like we talk all the time. Like he's super supportive and he like really just believes that the cannabis stuff is going to be a, a huge industry. You know, he's looking at it like a 20 and 30 year approach. When I did the label, I did it for, for 15 years or whatever, 12 years. There's a guy there that works with them named Phil Toronto, works with Gary, fan of the bands. We kind of connected on that a little bit, met with Gary at, uh, out here in LA, showed him what we were doing. Because the business is like an agency, but we have a bunch of brand IP. You know, we, we essentially own uh, a handful of cannabis consumer brands, but with uh, a handful of celebrity partners tied to them. But again, it's like I look, I work with basically all music people because I did the label. So that's what I speak. So that's how I know how to speak booking agent and manager and record label. So, you know, I have a deal with Two Chains and with uh, uh, Juicy J and with The Game, which are huge, obviously, musicians. So it's like I can work with those people. I work with Arthur Spivak, who was, I was working with, with the distillers. I don't know if you know Arthur, but crazy manager, managed Queens of the Stone Age. So he managed distillers. And we put out the Distillers record on Tarantulas when, with the explosion when I was running that label. Arthur Spivak was like yelling at me then for like royalties. And then like now I'm working with him, whatever, 15 years later on Cannabis Brand. But it's the same thing. It's like the same thing as the music is what I'm doing now. I, I, there's, I, could, I could just talk to you about all of that shit <laughs> you just talked about. Uh, but the one thing I got to say, though, is I'm a... I'm a giant fucking Gary Vee fan like I'm not like the diehard ones that like follow him and they're like they like you know hashtag hustle and all that shit because I've worked for myself for 16 years so I know you know I know what it's like to just be my own boss and shit but um I was listening to I just listened to the Guy Raz interview with him on how I built this and anytime that guy talks I just can't help but just get sucked in to listening to his shit because he's like he's got the energy but he also has tactics in things to do behind it. And I appreciate that because I fucking hate all of these quote unquote influencers that yeah. they just post a photo of themselves with a quote that they said. And I'm going, what are you selling? You're not fucking selling anything. I I go to New York to like work with Gary for days or at a time kind of thing. And I'll go work out of his office and blah, blah, blah. And have people come over there and they'll be like, Oh my God, let me get a photo of his desk or whatever. You know, that whole thing. Yeah. He'll be like, Oh, come to dinner tonight. I like, 10 o'clock or something at this place and i'm like oh my god 10 o'clock i'm like you know, usually in bed by then you know what i mean and i'm like holy f- okay fine so i show up and he's sitting there and he's with someone and then like 15 minutes later they leave and i get i get brought over and i'm sitting there with him for like maybe like 40 minutes or something and, and he doesn't eat i order food and he's just like maybe he eats like he's like like picking like blue, he eats like blueberries only i think he's like a robot that runs on blueberries but we ha- we talk and we go through the stuff and he just crushes so fast so awesome so crazy quick decision making decision making and then i'm like okay you ready to go and he's like oh no i got to i have another i have one of those people over there waiting for me and i was like you have another meeting after this he's like oh i got a few meetings after this and i was like what the fuck is happening and it was like a whatever tuesday or wednesday or some kind of week night or whatever and the dude's having meetings till midnight or one in the morning, like a fucking machine, That's you crazy. know? Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. So yeah, super inspiring to get to work with him. He's, uh, man. Yeah. He's amazing. I met Gary in like in 2011 before like he became super famous. He had the books out and I was at, I was working for uh, Maurice Canbar. I don't know if you know Maurice Canbar is, but no. crazy in- inventor guy. And uh, I was working for him on a new vodka company that he was launching and he launched Sky Vodka originally. So, and that he launched that when he was like 70, he has like 50 crazy patents. He invented, he, this guy, this guy is like a crazy old timer. He invented like the LED traffic light. He invented like the thing that, fu- that takes the fuzzy thing off your sweater, like straight up. This dude's like 80 years old and is like a crazy inventor. But he invited me to go see Gary speak. Because I like wore t-shirts and swore, you know, and he was like, you got to see this Gary guy. This is like your thing or whatever. Like, you know, you're going to like him or whatever. When I saw Gary then, I was, it was like all suit and ties. It was like this big wine event. I was the only person with a t-shirt on. And he saw Gary. He was like, dude, did you sneak in here? 
Like, what's going on? And I was just like, no, I was told to come see you and we both swear and blah, blah, blah. And he signed two books for me. And one book was uh, to me, like Rama, thanks for the support or whatever. It was like the thank you economy book. And the other book at the time was for uh, my current business, my, my business partner that I had at the time, the guy I started the, the, the cannabis agency with. And my, this guy didn't like Gary at all. The complete opposites. I was also the complete opposite of, the, of my old partner. His book was like, hey, you know, your name, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> and I brought it back and I gave it to, to, you know, my partner at the time. And he thought it was hilarious and he had it on a shelf. And then those, my, that partner ended up not believing in Green Street, the company I have now. And kind of like forfeiting his shares of the company. Just He just gave up on it. He just didn't think we were going to make it. He didn't think I could run it basically and do this. When he did that, I brought Gary in. And like that's when Gary bought half of the company is he bought essentially my old partner's shares, but they forfeited to me. It was crazy. I, I kind of call it the monopoly. They were just like, we've got to go to bed. We're tired. That's it. So it was a crazy thing meant to be. But again, like then Gary comes in later and yeah, man, it's, uh, it's nuts. But we're, we're, we're just getting started with, with Green Street. I'll wrap that up real quick. Basically, it's it's an agency that then turned into owning like five consumer brands that are different, you know, non-competing brands in cannabis space. It's a building we have in downtown Los Angeles. That's like a huge building. And and, it, and I listened to the Piebald, to Travis's interview. He talked about Inatech uh, in Boston that, that we built. This is basically Inatech for cannabis, but it's nine stories and it's 70,000 square feet. And it's um, like a $45 million version of Inatech, basically. It's going to have 50 of the biggest cannabis companies under one roof. But again, the idea came from the seat. You know, the idea came from when I started Inatech. I started Inatech and, and brought all those brands, you know, Christian Bridge Nine, and Matt Galley and Matt Pike and, and Hydrahead and, and Jen Malone and, you know, like all those people into the thing. But I'm doing that all again now, but just for weeks. You know, so uh, so yeah, so much comes from the scene. I think that some people there's some there's some people back in the day that you could see they were just go getters and in like bands you'd see like Gabe Saporta like he had a vision for sure. I saw Gabe at the airport not long ago. Really? Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that dude in fucking for last time. I think I saw him. I bumped into him when I was living in L.A. This 20 years ago at a liquor store. We were heading up to Hollywood Hills to a friend's house, and we walked. We're like Gabe Saporta. What the fuck? He's like like a music video question. Yeah, it was so random. He looks exactly the same. I thought he was 20 years old. Maybe he was like has lizard blood or whatever. But (laughs) um, he, um, yeah, fucking super awesome, killing it. Lots of different ventures. Yeah, and I literally was on a flight with him uh, not long ago. Like I think the last flight I took. From back from New York, he was on a plane together, and we talked down um, for a little while, and, and you know, I think we texted a little bit. He's actually connected me with someone that I might be working on a, a Green Street business with. Kind That's of crazy. So. I mean, it's like you could see you guys back then, and you, the, there was, ban- like, this the topic that comes up a lot in these interviews is that bands in general, the ones who create the music, are the ones that just don't make any fucking money. Most likely, I'd say like ninety something percent of them were the ones that they did it for a while, then they stopped, and now they're not doing music. But it's the business side of people or the people were in bands that had a business mentality. They went off and then they made it made success out of it. Like you were like that person, you could tell that it would do that. And it's it's interesting to see that. So it's like kind of like you had the idea back then, like you had said, you started music and you're kind of rep- replicating that now with a different like coat of paint basically. But the fundamentals are there that are kind of built in you. And I think there's a piece, there's something in people like that where you're like, I'm not, I wanted to get that thing to happen and it did happen, but then it stopped, but I really wanted to keep going. And I, it, it's like, you can't describe it, but it's, it's kind of like inside of you and you're going, well, I'm gonna do the same thing, but I'm gonna do it differently. Cause I'm gonna make this fucking happen. Yeah. I, and I think like even, you know, bad, old ideas aren't bad ideas. Right. You know, I, I launched a, a thing recently during the pandemic. I launched a, a company like a, a, one of the, the brands that we have with one of the, the partners. But it's an idea that I had for 10 years. I had the website for years before we even I even got it going, like literally like six years or something like that. I was trying to like do it. I mean, we just launched a, for, for Green Street. We launched a, a trade show here called Hall of Flowers. It's a cannabis like B2B show. So like it's dispensary buyers and brands and they show them their products and they take orders and it's, it's super clean. We have some incredible partners in it. 
oh, fuck. It's it's just all of it's done from the punk world. You know, everything that we're doing now, every single thing. I know you asked the question at the end of your thing, like the the ethics or whatever, and it's like, dude, like it's everything, right? It's PMA all day long. That's it. Like so much so, and then it's DIY my life. It's kind of like almost to my detriment, maybe. It's almost like too DIY. No, like you said like the bit. Nah, man, I, I I live that same thing, and like you can't. It does sometimes. You do maybe question it sometimes like that, but you're like, then there's a party goes. No, nah, this is just how I do it. I like you. I like I love your quick no because it made me feel good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I feel like okay, good, that's great. If you like, I feel like okay, you're, I'm not wrong. And but, you're doing uh, way but yeah, better man. than I am. But it's like it's like doesn't matter what level you're on if you have that in that part, and you can't. You can't. You're unemployable. Like I, I've. You can't work for yes. someone. Like you are. Like that's for sure. I am going to make whatever is in my fucking head come to life. Yeah, that's for sure. For sure. Yeah, it's almost like I, I was like how. Yeah, I don't even know how to describe it. That like drive or whatever the the thing. Stubbornness. I think it's. Uh... Stubbornness. Yeah. <laughs> my 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 friend, uh, the guy that I'm working with now on Green Street, calls me uh, the A and R of weed. That's my title. Like that's like my behind the scenes title. That like that that he thinks that's my role, you know? So, and of course, what it, that's full on music stuff, right? What's the Instagram for that? Is that green street smokes? Just oh, green no. street. No, just green street spelled out. Spelled, full, full words. Green street. S T R E E T. Okay. I have to follow that. Yeah. Yeah. That's the weed stuff. And, uh, yeah, man, it's crazy. I'm about to announce like a, a few other cool projects with that, but there's nothing that exists in the space, right? There's no rolling stone for cannabis. There's no South by Southwest for cannabis. There's no Coachella for cannabis. Like there's none of the stuff, you know, you, you had Mac rock. There's no Mac rock for cannabis. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't exist yet. It's fucking nuts. Like everyone's just trying to, these big ass fucking rich white people are just trying to go out and get own these like crazy licenses and control the, the supply chain. And like, I'm here with green street to protect the authenticity of cannabis. I want to be the, the right way to do this. You know, that's what I'm, that's what I'm here to do. So let's take that and let's, let's kind of, take where your mindset is now and the things you're constantly doing and look back to like what got you involved in the scene like were were you like the question is it's two parts like one what got you into the scene but at the same time the mentality that you have now did that start to develop prior to you finding the scene yeah like i always built skateboard ramps for sure and i couldn't never play an instrument at the same time yeah, you tried to play drums or something, and that was. I tried to play drums, couldn't. That's my joke, kind of. Yeah, I, got, I was in my friend Mark Rondina's basement. We were skateboarding, listening to Fugazi. Nirvana came out. I hated it. He wanted to make me play "Smells Like Teen Spirit" on the drums. I couldn't play it. I was like, "Fuck this!" Started, you know, I don't remember when exactly that was, but that was like the earliest memory of like wanting to do the music thing, but not the drums and music, not like instruments, not being the way to get there. And then when I was in high school. I met Dickie Cummings, <laughs> which is insane, and his brother Ben Cummings. Dickie was the lead singer of a band called Knockdown that was awesome, actually, and Trey McCarthy was in that band, who does Death Wish now, and, and who else was in that band? Probably, oh, and Aaron Dahlbeck was in that band from Bane. Some other people probably, too. Who the fuck was in that band? Like, awesome people were in Knockdown, and, uh, and, but I went to high school with him, and Trey lived right around the corner. We just started hanging out. Dickie... And I started putting shows on together and we just started booking like every like suburban, like hardcore band that was out in, in the, the middle, mid Massachusetts, like Framingham, Natick, between Worcester and Boston, basically, you know, like, but this is even before Boston. Yeah. This, I was 15 at the time when we were booking shows. Yeah. When we, when we did New Bedford Fest, when Kendra, Eddie, and then Kendra, I met Kendra, Eddie, we did New Bedford Fest. I was... Yeah, I think 16 when, I, when we did New Bedford Fest. I, I couldn't even drive to the event. I didn't know how to license even. Wait, you did New Bedford Fest? Yeah. What year was that? Um, it was only one or was it? three? No, we, she did one after me. We did one. I went to college and then she ended, she ended up doing another one. And I think I was on tour at the time. But yeah, Kendra's amazing. It was like super, super amazing friend of mine back then. Yeah, she was like a couple years older. So she like had a car and stuff and then... We like, yeah, it was crazy. So yeah, we did, we booked New Bed, and this is, dude, this is no cell phones, this is no internet. So like, we're booking New Bedford Fest from a payphone. I'm killing it in school, because I'm, you know, whatever, you know, at schools, high school, school was very easy to me. So I was like, doing very well there. So it was super easy to be like, hey, I need to go do this thing, or whatever. You know, I was also in a technical school, so 
there was shop and then there was academics the other week. So one week of shop, one week of academics. So like for like the shop weeks, it's eight hours sitting in like a computer lab. I was doing uh, mechanical engineering. So it was like sitting in like a fucking, you know, computer or like a, doing AutoCAD or like on a, on a fucking drafting board. It'd be so easy to sneak out for 20 minutes and I would go sneak out with a dialer, a payphone dialer. Yes. Yep. You know, yeah. And I would I would take the payphone dialer in high school, and I that's how we booked New Bedford. So I got all the bands. Like I, I called like Chad from Strife from a payphone to his parents' house, probably to like introduce myself and then get him to come play the show. That was huge. That first show was like three thousand people or something, and yeah, and I I had to like get a ride there from my parents. Wait, why was why did you choose New Bedford? Were you living up close to Boston? I think I think Kendra found the spot. No, I think the venue just was, would let us get away with it. Probably, you know what I mean. They were like, you, they'd. You was this at the the the, um, the halfway house kind of place that Ross Russ from All About Records used to book shows at? No, no, New Bedford. The first one, at least, was was in the gym. It was like a a, a VFW hall or something with a gymnasium. Oh wow! So that's okay. like the, all the photos have like the the like basketball rim above it. It's crazy. I met like my best friend uh, that I have. If you have best friends in life at the moment, you know, if you're as adults. One of my best friends, Jess Humphrey, uh, she she was like 15. She like lied to her mom, flew up from Virginia on a plane for the first time ever to go to New Bedford Fest, and we met there. And now like we're like talk like every every other day kind of thing. That's crazy. We played. I played New Bedford Fest in like '99 or yeah '98. Oh, amazing. 99. Yeah. There was another another one. Uh, yeah, cause that did you know all, all about records? This guy Russ, did you ever? Mm-mm. He he used to do shows in New Bedford. He was really good friends with Nuno and like the Smack and Isaiah, then the Wilhelm Scream guys. I know the last band only. Okay, so Wilhelm, yeah, Smack and Isaiah turned into Wilhelm Scream, and mm. so they. Well, that's good because Smack and Isaiah is definitely the worst band name I've ever heard, probably. <laughs> Yeah, I think it worked out for them because then they got signed to Nitro and they in Kung Fu, I think it was, but they did pretty well. Oh, dude, it was so even when you said Kung Fu, I just had a crazy flashback. It was so cool screwing, scrolling through your your podcast. You know, you've done a lot. Congrats, by the way, for putting this much work in. Thank you. Thanks, man. And uh, but it was so cool seeing that and like being like, holy fuck, Weston, or holy fuck, this like with this thing or that label. I was like, super crazy flashbacks on it. Super cool. Oh, totally. There, there's been some wins. Like when I got Chuck from Weston, I almost, I almost fucking died. I was like, I can't believe. Yeah, and Farside, Popeye, like dude, I, Farside. I loved Farside. He's the coolest guy. He is like the nicest. After we were done talking, we talked for like another two hours because he was like, "How are you? Like, what are you up to?" I was like, "I've never met you, and you're like the the best person." It was crazy. He's, he's so cool. I love. I listen to that band like every day. Like, and I, and I did their shows. Like, I, I booked every single band that ever came to Boston. At like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows I booked. Where was your main spot that you booked uh, shows at when you were up there? I, probably the Middle East, I would say. You know, Middle East upstairs. I, I like own that Mahmood who crushes it still. Another person crushing it from the from the, the music scene. He was the agent there, and then they had a downstairs booking agent. You know, that was a little bigger room, right? Because that was that was five hundred people. So, oh well, can't do downstairs. Upstairs is safer, you know. But yeah, we, you know, I did that, and then we did the Rat. I did so many shows at the Rat Skeller. Oh my God, so many shows. What else was there? TT the. I mean, a ton of spots. Like oh, all TT those the Bears. spots. Yeah. TT the Bears. I'm trying to think of, like in order the spots I booked the most. Even like Michael Porman's basement. Mike Porman, if you know uh, him, like a uh, drummer for uh, Hot Rod Circuit. He lived in Boston before that. Amazing guy. He we he did shows. We, we I booked shows at his house. I think we did Jimmy World there, and it was like four bucks or two bucks to get in. It was either Get Up Kids or Jimmy World. And it was like, you know, there. But he probably had 20 of the craziest bands ever from the scene play at his. Wasn't this when they were Hot Rod Circuit or they were a different name before they were Hot Rod Circuit? <sighs> I don't remember. I'm trying to think. I did the vinyl for Hot Rod and they were like part of the family, of course, like super, super good family. And I did the Sissy Bars after that, Casey and his wife's uh, uh, other band, basically just because before I even heard it, Casey was like, hey, I want you to put out my, my band I'm going to do with my wife. I was like, yep. No problem. Whatever it is, just send it over. You know, that was to the point where like the label was really cranking, and we had a staff and stuff. But, but yeah, in the beginning, it was just like we did these shows, and Dickie and I kind of wrapping this up, right? And and one of the bands that we booked ended up we booked every band, by the way, like every fucking sick band that exists out there. We booked. We would a lot of the times when headlines were coming through or people were coming from out of state, we would book uh, a band called Cast Iron Hike. 
as the opener and uh, or the local maybe not even the opener but like the local thing because they would draw like 50 or 100 extra kids and it was easy to put them on and and you know like they could justify it and then you know blah 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 and we thought they were amazing dicky and i we thought we, they were just and they were different but again as you look at all the catalog of all the stuff i've done most of it's different they were um so fucking sick and no one wanted to sign them and we were super confused by that and well they we were like, they it. were they were an instrumental band though right no, ca- no, no, that's Cancer Conspiracy. Oh, okay, Cancer Conspiracy, Night. yes. Yeah, okay, okay, that's a super weird band. Yeah, I love that. We can talk about the whole podcast episode about that. But, uh, but yeah, no, Cast Iron Hike was um, a band by, it's, it was Jake Brennan. Jake runs the number one music podcast in the, the world, I believe. It's called Disgraceland. Oh, fuck and, yeah, uh, okay. Oh, yes, that's right. He mentioned that in interviews. Okay. Yeah, he does double Elvis. Yeah, and so he was, he sung for Cast Iron Hike. His dad is an amazing blues musician. And uh, so Jake had this like blues kind of vibe. Jake and I were also roommates in, in at, I think at the time, we were like, we were sharing an apartment in Boston and a guy named Chris Pecky. And anyway, amazing, amazing musicians. People just didn't want to put the record out. So Dickie and I were like, okay, we have all this money from doing all the shows. Let's essentially invest it, quote unquote, into starting a record label and Cast Iron Hike will be the first artist. Was it just a just a split second decision where you went from well I've got I'm comfortable doing shows so record label seems like ah that seems kind of similar let's just fucking do that well yeah that's why it was so awesome I mean like at the punk stuff we would have to build a stage or you'd see someone selling like vegan food or every, dude we had a zine called Pez Dicky and I at one point you know we did two issues of it we snuck into the school and used the photocopier for free. And just designed it at school, you know, and it's like awful. We interviewed like all these fucking bands and stuff. But that's what you did. You just went out and you, you didn't, we didn't look at it like businesses, right? You look at it like I'm doing a zine or I'm, I'm you know, making food or, you know, the vegan brownies or I'm doing, people were making like necklaces or, you know what I mean? Selling, people had their little distros, they were selling vinyl, like Rick to Life fucking selling like a little shopping mall in there, Jamie Josta <laughs> selling stuff. But we didn't look at it like business. Like today, if I were to tell a friend that I'm like, like, hey, like we should go make a magazine and give it out at these shows or try to sell at these shows, like most of my people I know would like want to see a business plan before they would like start it. I, not even kidding you or trying to show off for the interview, I literally am working on a zine right now that I started yesterday. I have like more, more than half of it done and I'm making a zine right now for my trade show that I have coming up in a month. And I have a designer that works for me full time. I could definitely have them design this thing, but I want to make this thing. So yesterday and today I'll finish it because I'm just, you know, one works on the weekends except for me, I think. So I'll go through and I'll crank this out and it will be like parts wrong with it. And I'll be like, oh, that's fucked up and this isn't perfect and whatever. But like, I've been telling my clients for the past five years to do little print book things for their brands and it, they overthink it so much totally. that like, it never, never comes out. I'm like, fuck it. I'm just going to do this shit myself because I've seen it work in the past. And again, I'm taking this, like I'm building, it's not epitaph. Like I'm building more than that. I'm building the, you, you know, I don't know if you know who Lou Wasserman is, but Lou Wasserman, amazing documentary for into like, music, crazy, you know, movie documentary, uh, Lou Osterman, The Last Mogul, but he created what we essentially know as Universal Pictures and then Universal Everything Else. And then he was like, uh, you know, got some presidents elected and all this shit. I don't care about politics. So that's not, that doesn't interest me. But the idea of like building this amazing foundation around, he built it around the music industry and around the movie industry. That's what I'm doing now. I feel around cannabis. I'm, I'm unlike music. Like there, there wasn't room to do much stuff in music because the industry has been existing for a hundred years. I love the, th- I love that you said you're like, don't overthink it. I talk to freelancers or all the time and they're like, well, I need a website. Oh, no, you don't. You need someone to buy the fucking thing. So what can you do today to make it happen? Like, I, I'm always like, what's the quickest thing you can do to start the shit and then build the shit as you're going along? Well, the funny thing is on websites, I'll, I'll build a website in an, in an afternoon. Would, you know, yeah, like, and you can. You know, you can. Like, you know, but again, you can overthink it and do the stuff. I still have that, like, go fast, try it out, taste everything. You know, go to the, the, you know, use the dialer. Like when you were saying forty bucks, you're spending or whatever on Skype or whatever. Like, dude, that's that's your dialer. Like, I no, full respect. It's the opposite of me thinking that it's stupid. It's like I'm like, this is doing it right. Because people spend money on dumb shit. 
then you're then you see like then you're out of it and then you see these like again can you branch earlier these musicians that kind of are, are as max bemis would say are are patting themselves on their back as they starve like these these people that right i don't know if you heard max's line but no, 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 no. Uh, yes. What was what? No, which you know, you know, say are you saying you know say anything? Of course, oh, I sir. fucking I fucking love saying I love saying anything okay, up cool. till the fourth album, and then I just kind of lost track. I didn't know they did more than one. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I did the first one. You know, I did, I did, I did as a real boy with Max. Like I, I, everything about it. Every person that's on it, I got. You know, he lived at my house while he was making it for months at a time. Um, like literally in the living room, you know, sleeping on a case. He was like in high school, I think, or just graduating. What else? I mean, the artwork we did in house, obviously I managed them. I, you know, got him Andrew Ellis, like everything that's going on there. I did with say anything with Max and, and he was, he was the most like raw talented person, musician I probably ever met. If I had to rank it, if, if there was a Rushmore kind of thing or whatever, it would be like Jimmy, Jim Adkins for sure. In, insane 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 jim atkins is like a could be like a gary v of of the music space like so composure smart thoughtful and just so brilliant and talented yeah so there jim he, he's like what you, he's better than what you see he's the nicest dude on the planet and then max is like well was right now he's healthy which is way better but then you know he was i mean dude max got lost max cut uh, I should, well, I don't know. Max, Max. I know it's pretty much out there that he had like a fucking breakdown in the city because he didn't realize. He, they, I read one time he was just smoking a lot of weed and he needed medication and he didn't realize that when he got on it he was a lot better. So it's that, that stuff's kind of out there, but there, obviously there's other yeah. shit. That yeah, other we smoked an insane amount of weed for sure, dude. I mean, I would buy weed from him. Like he had he had better weed than anyone in LA, <laughs> you know. But that's what happens when you grow up in LA in high school. I mean, dude, Max was the cover. Of Raising Arizona, the movie, there's what? a baby on the poster. That's Max. I did not know this. What? Like Max's, Max's dad, Peter Bemis, is the, I think, number one, like legitimately number one movie cover designer of all time. Wait a minute. He's the kid in that movie? He's the, he's the baby on the poster for the movie. That, so Peter Bemis is famous. So they make the movie and then they hire Peter Bemis to do the cover and like the poster and the billboard kind of art, yeah. you know, like the, what, what the humans are going to like take the movie as basically, you know, yeah, yep. how to set up, how to frame the movie up for people. So every David Litch film you've ever seen, he did, he did like adaptation, you know, with the, the pot and stuff. And, um, he did, uh, he did racing Arizona, Peter Bemis, unbelievable, unbelievable. And, but that's Max's dad. And so the photo Max, so P- Peter had a photo of Max as a baby and used him on the poster, you know, of the of the thing. Is it the poster where they're sitting on the the lawn chairs or whatever, just looking at the sunglasses uh, on? You know, I'm blanking on it. I'm blanking on. It. If you Googled it, I I could. I, I'm blanking on it. But uh, but I just remember being at the house and Matt and Peter telling me that that was Max on the on the thing. That's fucking. You know, crazy. but yeah. So Max is like a virtuoso back then. But also Max and Sam Cave from the explosion. Sam and Max kind of were at the time suffering from. What to me seemed like the same kind of manic kind of states or whatever, and Max has became pretty uh, unmanageable, and to the point where I was so scared, like he got locked up a couple times, you know, and arrested and stuff, and or whatever, and and I got so scared that I would just say the wrong thing to him, and he could take his life, own life or something, right? Like I was just like, or trigger him. So that's why I stopped working with with say anything. Cause like the, 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 everyone else just wanted him on tour. And I was like, this is fucked up. I was like, I can't do this. Like, I, I don't know money in the world is going to be worth it. If I get a call saying that, you know what I mean? I, I can't even, I can't even say it out loud. Now. You know what I mean? It's like so crazy. I had heard about this back in the day when, when, so when is a real boy came out and we're going to jump back to more like how the label started and stuff and kind of jump all the place, but love us going. Um, like I remember, but so wait a minute, I thought, I know there has always been a connection between Big Wheel and Doghouse. What I and I remembered it back. I just cannot th- thread that together right now because Doghouse put out put out is a real boy though. Um, it, yeah, I was managing the band. That okay, that that's the yeah. Connect. Max that's wanted it. to do the record on Big Wheel, um, and Dirk had, um, Dirk had actually. I, I want to say Dirk had actually discovered Max. I believe, and I think he showed it to me, and he was in Ohio, I was in LA. 
but I was managing, uh, and then my team was managing a, a doghouse for a lot of records, like like the rejects, like all American rejects. I did, you know. I mean, those dudes, those dudes, those dudes slept on my floor for for every time they we came to LA until and they exploded immediately. But Max was discovered by Dirk. I was I was A and Ring it right, perfect, right, and putting it all together. And Max wanted to be on Big Wheel, but we would have it would have been like a uh, a, a weird conversation with Dirk. So I, I just let Dirk do it or basically, you know, I didn't want to like get in some weird like battle over putting the record out or whatever. But yeah, that was on Doghouse. I managed it. And then I brought, you know, Andrew Ellis in who I worked with for the beginning of his career uh, in, on the agent side. And then Kevin Kasatsu ended up um, taking the, like I tried to co-manage, but again, like, you know, I was getting calls from a, you know, uh, I was going to collect calls from a, from Max in the hospital. The professionals I talked to about it were like, oh, bro, like you should not be, you're not qualified to like talk to someone in the state. Because I was, I don't know how old I was at the time, but you know, it's like 10 plus years ago, right? 15 years ago or something, whatever. Like I was much, I still wouldn't be able to do it now, but like that was so, I was so scared. I'd say like the word banana or something and he'd go off. So I just didn't want to, I didn't feel comfortable being around it. I feel like I was going to get one of those calls, like something happened to Max kind of thing. So I stepped down and obviously it fucking exploded and blew up. But yeah, everything on that record, you know, I mean, Max is a genius and he wrote the whole fucking thing. Genius. But like I, I, if, if it was like today and I was working on that record, doing the same amount of work, it would have been like produced by Rama Mayo whatever, not my name as manager, and then it's cut out of the liner notes for the reprint of the record or whatever. Wasn't, didn't he work with a person from, um, what was that, that movie? Um, oh my God. It was like a musical. Yeah. Yeah. Tim O'Hare, uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Yeah. Tim O'Hare did, uh, did that. And then the guy that, that yeah, did it, you know what? I think that, I don't know. So Max was doing that when he was, I'm blanking on that person's name, but uh, the person that wrote that, but he was, I think they were in New York working on that. And that's really when he started going kind of, I was like, when he had one of his biggest episodes, I guess he was the, the creative force, you know, he was still in high school. So he would be looking like anyone to like outside opinion for stuff. Uh, I, Max is like, I don't know how much he would tell you now, how much, who put what in on it, but like Max could see the future on the stuff, you know, he was, and, and the problem is right. Like, I mean, okay, it's what Kanye has now, right? It's like it's like the problem with this this creativity brushes crushes through your 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 brain so fast and so unbelievable, so next level. Max would just be like, Oh, I'm gonna hear listen to this song I'm gonna write right now. And he would just play me like the, some of the most craziest, beautiful shit I've ever heard. Like, but it takes a toll on the rest of your life. You know, so the creativity isn't worth it if you can't be a normal person, you know, or like exist, right? And Sam Cave from the explosion was the same way. You know, we he would he'd smoke a puff of a joint and then like we wouldn't see him for like 10 hours and he'd be like, oh I just wrote these five songs. And he'd play us these songs that were like the craziest, I mean most insane songs ever. Like I remember right now, like specifically like him playing me a song like fucking whatever it is, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. It's like so insane. And I'm like, what he's like, I'm just writing it as we right now. I'm just writing it. As, as I play it, yeah, there's just that, that and that scared me. So I, I wasn't professional enough to deal with like the mental, you know, part of anyone's world unless it was just like making them happy. Well, it seems like you had a really good. I I can like man, I can just stay on that. For, I love saying anything so much, but I'm like I've just tried to cut this up to like just different sections. But um, I mean, there's so many things. I was like, I gotta talk to Gary Vee forever. I could talk about fucking say anything forever. But like, it seems like you had. There's a lot of people from back then or that I remember that just had a way to, they just kind of, they had an ear for something. Like I talked to Amy from Fiddler Records and she, a lot of bands that she signed is like she, with just, she, her inner antenna was just, I just, this is just what I liked. But there was something about that, that what she liked is what a lot of people liked. And so certain record labels had that antenna and like you had that as well. And I mean, it led to like, I mean, I'm obviously cheating right now because I have Discogs open, but you have like, you know, you've cast on a hike to 10 yard fight. But then it says that. So it says 97 is when you put out the split with Jejun and Jimmy World. Is that right? It was a 97. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 
how the fuck did that happen? Because that I still own. I'm looking at that seven inch. I bought it back <laughs> then. I still own it. And um, what would I say to you so now? Cool. I think is the best Jimmy Eat World song ever written. Um, oh, I mean, so there's cool. others that are up there, but I think that is the greatest song. When I play that record, I when I bought it, my mom had a vinyl had a, a record player. I I played it, and I was like, I can't stop listening to this goddamn song. And I, that, Jim yeah. Atkins, man. It's crazy, Jamaican. dude. The, the fucking guy, man. Genius. He's fucking genius. Yeah. Zach's, Zach's like the, the you know, Zach the drummer's like the business side of it. And Jim's the, the creative side. And Tom and Rick and Zach are, are super creative, like incredibly creative. They just, man, I mean, how, how crazy is it that they met like together? It's like a, it's meant to be kind of thing. But it's like we all, when we all who love Jimmy world, who loves static prevails. Like when, the people who love static prevails, when we heard that record, I love static prevails. When I, heard, I, I heard it before I met them and it, it, I listened to it every day on repeat. Yeah. That's why like that led to so many bands. Like, like that's like, that led to me loving mineral and like finding all these bands, but like how, yeah. So, so J June was in Boston and they were going to Berkeley music and J June couldn't be three of the most different people on the planet. Basically. And, uh, but they were going to school together and they, they had a band and they were just, you know, made a demo or whatever. And Dave Karen, I think is his name was, uh, a friend of mine that we skated with. We were at part of the skate, you know, little world there a little bit. And he just was like, dude, I know you fuck with music. You should check this band out or whatever. I think that's how it happened. And I met Jay June and they are fucking three of like the most talented musicians ever they were all going to berkeley school of music so like each one of them is like could just do their own thing and they you know were just trying to do the band like a little bit like they had school and they they thought they'd have other stuff going on and that's why jay jr never really popped is because they i mean if, if they kept together after this afternoon's malady came out they would have been huge but they just didn't want to do it they just they even now they still like have no interest in, in playing. And I think it's just, they were doing it as like a, a college project kind of almost, it seems like when I look at it, you know, but, uh, but they were back in San Diego for uh, Christmas and they met Jimmy world. And I think they played at one of the shows out there, KXLU or whatever that might be that kind of thing or whatever the, that, 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 that little, whatever that venue was out there i'm blanking on the name but was it a club or uh, was it the like yeah um, i think a club at the college i think they did it, where kxlu was i think they did a lot of shows there maybe i'm m- mashing those two together but but anyway they played some you know jimmy world static reveals was out jimmy world was playing in san diego jay june was there they went and just talked to the band because at that point it was like 12 people there probably <laughs> and they were like oh we like your band then they asked Jay June on the spot to go open up for them the next day, I believe in Arizona. Wow. So then Jay June's like, fuck it. And they just went and they did it. And then it was like, Chris, I think Van, Van from, uh, from Jay June, the drummer was like, like we, you know, I, you got to meet Rama and he's a fan and blah, blah, blah. And then when they were on, when I was talking to them, I was like, Holy fucking shit. You, I, I love your band. Let's do it every day, <laughs> you know? And they were, they were getting lied to by the labels they were on and yeah. they weren't happy with anything. And, you know, at one point I was Jimmy world's booking agent. I booked a full tour for them. Wow. I, you know, again, it was like washing machine status, like, you know, like some of basement shows and little houses and things like this. At that point, I was not managing them because they had like some major label managing kind of people that never really worked out. And then of course, then they went over to, to where they are now, you know, John Silva, uh, who's the king of the stuff. So, so they're, they're, they've been sorted for a long time, but, but yeah, in the beginning between static prevails and clarity, basically they, I was just like there for them doing whatever. And Jim, you know, Jim made those records and they, those guys like just basically like, were just cool. You know, they didn't have to eat. So the Jimmy world, JJ and split's not a big deal, but to like have me do like singles or, or, you know, the, that kind of stuff, like they didn't have to do that. Like they could have got huge advances from people to, to go and do a record with, you know, they just wanted to work with me on it. Like, I mean, dude, they put me in the record club. I mean, I, I, I laid it out technically of singles, but like Jim, Jim designed the record. He sent me like a sketch of 
how the record layout should be. And I just like did it, went to quick Cork Express and, you know, Photoshop and made it happen. But, Damn. you know, Jim put me in the record cover. Like if you look at singles and you open it, it's like, there's a photo, a bunch of photos of people, small bottom. And there's a photo of me in there, like a headshot. It's like crazy. You know, those guys were just so nice. And I didn't know that I could have become Epitaph or, or a, a vagrant or whatever. I didn't think that I could start take like my hobby that turned into a business that then like would really have to like rely on, you know, stuff. And like, you know, I'd have to like take these bands, like, like I could have put out Jimmy world records more if I had a little bit of money. In hindsight, it's like, I could have just went and probably got money from anybody. People would have begged to give me money back then. I had no idea that you could even do that. You know, I thought the only place you could get money was like at a bank. So, you know, I didn't know that like, you could do like a friends and family round or a fucking whatever rate, you know, <laughs> raise funds and stuff like that. But I mean, dude, the crazy is Chris Caraba, amazing guy, amazing guy. Chris Caraba, I turned him down to be on Big Bill. And he was huge at the time. Why? Why just turn Because him I couldn't handle it. He was like, Rama, like we walked around uh, Gainesville Fest in, in uh, Florida. And um, I was on tour with Pieball, I'm sure. And, and, and Chris played there. And we took a walk around like the, the perimeter. And he said straight up, I want to be on Big Wheel. But... I'm fucking blowing up as you see, you know what I mean? And I need video and I need record budget. And he was like super about his business. Like it was no manager telling me this is the deal. He was like, I need this, 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 and this, you know what I mean? And it was like, I was like, I can't do it. I was like, I can't commit to like giving you tour support. Right. Cause like, I've never done that before. You know what I mean? I'm tour support. I make vinyl for artists and I send them a bunch of t-shirts. And I'm not like, can't like help you get a bus. Like, what are you talking about? Meanwhile, didn't realize that like, if I did it, I could afford a bus. So like, but again, no, I don't have regrets or anything like that. And Chris, maybe if I did do it, maybe I couldn't have got Chris to where he is. So, you know what I mean? It's all, it's, it's fucking glad that he did. Was there something about him telling you that though, when he said, Hey, I need this and this, was there a part of you that didn't believe that he was like, that you didn't believe what he believed? Oh no, hundred percent. I believe it. I, I saw it. I saw. It, I saw. I saw. I saw five hundred kids out of five hundred kids in the room sing every word. And then I saw every band go on before and after and have like two hundred kids maybe care a little bit. So this is kind of this is kind of jumping more in the present or between that moment and then today, because that's one of those things where I think anyone could look back in their life and think, man, there was that one sh- you know quote unquote shot I didn't take. No, it's not the shot, dude. It's not that. It's, I look at it like it's the wave that I'm like. Dude, that thing's maybe too big. I, that could kill me. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not a, sh- it, it wasn't, I don't look at it like the shot. I look at it like it's a good that I didn't go out and mess with it. Cause like, you know, it was like too much. It's like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to hook a great white shark on the thing. You know what I mean? Cause I love, cause I love Chris. What if I couldn't deliver? Jimmy World, same way. Was there other decisions though, meaning like where something came that you thought was a bit bigger than what you could handle and you're like, you're like, fuck that, this time I'm going to do My, it? Yeah, dude, of course, everything since then. Yeah, like Green Street, dude. Green Street is like the thing I have now. Do you ever see like the photo on Reddit or something of like the fish that like died because it bit something so big it couldn't even swallow it down its mouth? That's like how that's that that could be me with Green Street, right? Like you know, right now I feel like talk about the big wave, like the guys that surf those hundred foot waves. Right now I feel like those guys that surf like right now I feel like those guys that surf those hundred foot waves, and I'm killing it and so locked in, bah, bah, like killing it. But any second, I could just spin off and just fucking die and just explode. That's like why back then, where I didn't think I could handle Chris, now I'm building something where no one will outgrow me. I said like the exact same feeling I got before by Chris Caraba is the same feeling I got from the brands now. Now I know. But again, there's no million other you know major labels to compete with. There's not a hundred years of of business to like fight against, swim upstream against. You know, it's like a very open playing field in cannabis compared to music. But I think that like that's kind of when we first started talking, I said there's something at certain points in this conversation where I'm like people have an antenna for things like that or they're just built for, you know, this is why you're still DIY and all that. If there's I think that sometimes and this is kind of getting spacey and out there in like universe <laughs> and all that shit, I but it. like I think that I, I'm a big fan of just looking back at my life and not putting this on me, but I've seen things where I wanted it to be a certain way back then, but now it's happening with a different coat of paint, like I said. And I think sometimes like how we're, you're referencing, a lot of people reference the scene. There was something that built this character, this thing in us, this muscle that later on you almost kind of 
got to do that thing again, but just differently, but it's bigger and it kind of set you up to be, well, maybe this wasn't your time, but now this is your time, but you've got to, you got to fucking take it. Yeah. Like, 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 uh, like, uh, Dan Keyes would say from recover, if it's bad timing, it's all right. I've gotten more into recover lately after <sighs> Amazing I, I, band. I never loved that band. I, yeah. I, Amazing when I band. interviewed, I interviewed Matt from Emmanuel and we were talking about this unreleased record. And then I talked to Amy and she goes, yeah, I released that record. So then I bought it from her and I'm listening and it's that uh, challenger. And, uh, yeah, it's recover, like so, I don't, I, 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 recover I don't was know crazy. I don't know if you know about that whole thing, but like recover was like the craziest, craziest. Like, I don't want to name their names because of the top, top, a and R music presidents on the planet chasing them. I'm talking about the main dudes getting kicked out of other dudes' offices because they snuck in. I'm talking about like the dudes that have pedigrees of multiple diamond selling records all were chasing to recover. Like they were they they were gonna be the 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 bigger death tones. They were gonna be the you know the 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 Metallica for the next generation or whatever. Like Dude, crazy. Really? Cra- yes, dude. Huge, huge. That was like right – that explosion signed right after that. That was like basically what put all the record labels out of business is signing all these bands. You, you mentioned before River City High, Sunk Cave-In. You know, this is this is what the music industry does though, right? Like you, you, I heard you talk about the explosion before. Like when the explosion – when we, when we signed – because I was managing them when we signed the Virgin, Flash, Flash, Flash cost the explosion 2000 bucks to make on J tree. And it's awesome. The next record of black tape we made, I think we spent 400 grand on it. What? Yeah. That and record costs 400,000 like fucking dollars. I think so. I think so. I think that's, I think that's what, what, what we ended up spending. Maybe more, maybe more. I, we, we made a video for, for probably, I was going to say 50 grand, maybe less, maybe more like tens of thousands of dollars that we, that we scrapped. That was the skateboarding you know, video we, where they're like kids skateboarding in the beginning and was that that video? Uh, no, no. The, the skateboard video is the one we did with John Lacroix afterwards, uh, where it's it's Smitty from AFI handing out flyers um, for the show. We had to make that video because the the label hired the guys that make like the big you know MTV videos at the time to to come make the explosion video, and we we're like, this is not the right fit. We're telling you and. And, you know, it was the label trying to, well, it's what they do, right? They try to get it on radio. That's all they do. That's it. That's well, all they care about. Let me ask you this. What did you think of that record, Black Tape? Um, I mean, I think... Um, Cause that was hyped up like crazy. Well, yeah, I did. That, that's good. Thank you. That's my job. So now, now I feel great about it. Cause, you know, <laughs> but yeah, they, it's the... I mean, it sold more than the last record. You know, that's the thing. They, you can't... Like, the record... If it was on J Tree, it would have been a, a, a hit, huge hit on J Tree or on Big Wheel, you know, huge hit. But uh, it's too many cooks in the kitchen. And and real quick, like I don't, I, I know you mentioned this before. Just, I want to correct you because Explosion broke up before that happened. Explosion were done. That was the best thing that ever happened. To me, Black Tape that that bought them years of life and hundreds of thousands of dollars each. Like they were not, they were done. They broke. They exactly how that happened is they were on tour. Um, doing a final couple shows ever, and they played the Troubadour. And I had been living in LA for a couple years. I knew all the A and R people, all the major, you know, label people. And I'm at the Troubadour, and I'm like, dude, there's like everybody's in this room. There's like every single label was there. And I was like, what the fuck's going on? Like, and then they all came for the explosion because they come like right when the band plays and leave right after the band plays. You know, so they don't, they don't you know, it's very obvious who they're there for. And so I mentioned it to the band. I was like, dude, what the fuck? Like, you guys are signing a deal? And he's like, they're like, what do you mean? No. And I was like, no, nah, dude, you can tell me. I get it. Like, I, I knew, dude, everyone was here tonight. And he's like, the band's like, no, no, what do you mean? What do you mean? The next day, I'm, uh, and they were on a tour band called The Damn Personals. We were playing a Gilman Street the next day up in San Francisco. Amazing. And we get to Gilman. And the band's like, dude, how did you know? <laughs> and I was like, and, and then they were like, we got three phone calls today from labels. And I was like, yeah, well, I told you. And they're like, dude, can you handle this? Can you like manage us? And right there on the spot in Berkeley at, 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 thing, at Gilman, I became the Explosions manager. And they were breaking up. And I called Steve Sessa. I don't know if you know Steve Sessa, but no. one of the number one music attorneys on the planet. He does um, now, he does most famously the Queen Bee. You know, he does, he does uh, Beyonce. 
Oh, okay. and, I was uh, like, and Rihanna I was, I was and like, a few other things. Talking about? Okay, oh, yeah. yeah, the Queen Bee. Yeah, well, geez, don't say who you're talking about with Queen, with Queen Bee fans. <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't want to get them on your, on your fucking case. Yeah, seriously, I don't want to get canceled. But, uh, but yeah, so he, do, he did them, and, and he called, you know, two, two of the band members flew home to go back to work to probably think they're never going to play a show again. And two of the guys stayed behind with me, and we made some calls, and Steve basically got us a deal, you know, in two hours kind of thing. Everyone was in the room the night before and, you know, and the band was like friends with all the cool people and they were funny and they were like good looking and, and the kids were moshing like crazy and singing along. So if you're an a &R guy in the back and a troubadour, trust the venue, sold out kids singing along, you know what I mean? It's like, that's okay. You, this is a real band. So they, we start a bidding war. Basically you meet with every label that exists, every, every president of every label. I mean, dude, I'm talking about, we sat down with Jimmy Iovine 10 times. We met. Steve Berman and, and Mark Williams and the whole world. And they showed us Eminem for the first time ever. They showed us 50 Cent for the first time ever. They were like, here's this guy. He's called 50 Cent. And it's like Jimmy Iovine showing us. Jimmy Iovine played us, you know, Lose Yourself in the Moment Eminem song or whatever before the movie came out to like get us to sign to Interscope. We met with every other major person, you know, V2 and John Seidel and which was Richard Branson's company at the time, Keith, you know, Keith Morris and, we, we met with fucking all the indie labels, but, but really like Virgin, David Walter came in for, I don't know if you know David, but unbelievable, unbelievable fucking person. David Walter came in at the last minute. He, we, first of all, he said, I want the last name you're going to take. And we were like, okay, I already like this guy. You know, he has already has something to plan here. And he took the last meeting and he told us everything everyone said. And he's like, you know, and I saw this with Jimmy World getting lied to by the label a million times, a million times. We knew that the last check, the first check we were going to get was probably the only check we were going to get because the band was broken up. They don't, you know what I mean? They're not even trying to be a band. That was it. That's all they cared about. They cared about how much, what the, what the advance was. So we signed a virgin. We got a lot of money. I, I mean, I think like a million dollars kind of thing, you know, and um, they did the record, got a bunch of more money, tour support, went on the road and stuff. But it was, it's like the typical major label thing, right? Like black tape is like a, a, a fault of that. Like if you look back at all the good records that, that these guys would have made, it, none of them would be made this way. It was a process. I, I can't even, I can't even listen. I couldn't even tell you maybe the songs on black tape. Now, if we played it, I would like remember them or whatever. But, um, and I think there's some good tracks on there. But then it became like how to do this for a living. I know you talked before with Travis about that. Can you do it for a living? How long do you, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like these guys were like signed to Virgin Records. They're not trying to like work at a, a restaurant or something anymore. And they're trying to have like other jobs. They're trying to like do this for, for full time. The record didn't hit. It was basically radio and, they, and, and the label gave up, gave up on it immediately. Just like, I mean, they told us they were, they were giving up on it. You know, they were like the, you know, it was crazy. And then I don't even know what happened. They fired me uh, basically right before the next advance. So I, I really, I mean, I don't know. It could have been coincidence, whatever. I would imagine they fired me because they didn't want me to get my like percentage of the, of the next record. Yeah. So that's what happened. It like, it hurt, you know, cause I, I, I own tarantulas. So I ran tarantulas with them as well. Right. So that's the, that's the Bronx and the distillers and, you know, the lot six and, you know, a bunch of other great bands that I did on that label. So when, when the explosion fired me from uh, managing them at the same time, I'm not going to try to run the record label. So that whole thing was just like shut down because of it really. And that's what happened back with Piebald. When Piebald fired me, we stopped big wheel basically because it was like, what's the, they were like the main thing. And so it was right before that, right? Piebald fired me, but I was already managing the explosion and say anything. So, and I had big will going and then with the explosion, I'm making more from the explosion in a week than I'm making in a year from big wheel. Like for real, you know what I mean? The checks I'm getting from explosion are like, if I was smarter, I would have bought a house. It was like on that level. And then we're like the other records, there's, there's no money, you know? And I, again, I put it all back in, right? I'm like, I'm like so invested in the shit that every cent from big wheel, I'm just putting back into the label, back into the label, back into the label, every, all, every cent of it, you know, I'm getting iced coffee and like a bagel at Dunkin' Donuts, and then that's it. <laughs> and then the rest goes back in. Yeah, I mean, I asked you the question about that record because when I got it, because it was so hyped up when I bought it, and we're going to move off the explosion in a second, but like, I, 
I got it and I was just like, it just kind of fell flat for me. I, I was just like expecting yeah. something like at this energy or boost. And I felt all the songs were just like this flat line. Yeah. They brought in like, dude, it was so wild. Like they brought, like, again, the complete opposite, right? They brought in, by the way, Brian McTurnan, quick, I want to shout out to Brian McTurnan. You know, he's the goat of all this stuff. Um, you know, the guy that, you know, you know, Brian, obviously. So. I'm, I'm totally blanking right now. Brian was in Ashes and he's in Battery. Nope. Singer of Battery, but he, but he recorded every band ever. Every band. He recorded Texas the Reason Records. He recorded um, about all, half of my records he recorded. Oh, um, yeah. okay. I yeah. believe that he recorded, I think that he recorded Flash, Flash, Flash. I believe that he did. Maybe he didn't. But, um, but yeah, the label doesn't want Brian McTurnan or like some indie people. They want Jason Carmer, I think, made the record. He made like the Google Doll Google Doll records and stuff. It's fucking ridiculous. Dude, the explosion made their record after trying to make the record in a bunch of different places and being distracted. We it was like from a movie. We like rented a a studio with its own private airstrip in Idaho. And like we had a chef that would go hunt like a turkey for real in the morning that we'd eat you know, later on or whatever, What? you know, and yeah, like <laughs> they, they, from like, they made like, you know, I don't, I'm making up the bands, but like John Denver records there and whatever, like they made like huge, like huge, huge hit records at this like secluded space, it had like a fucking lake to go fishing and shit. And, um, and that's where we ended up making most of the record, but you know, they're, they're fighting. Right. Cause also, so then at this point, right. I, I'm just like full, I'm fully per, maybe like, uh, I don't know this, but I'm just assuming this is happening, right? So think of it like, okay, the record's finally done. It's coming out. Now it's like, well, there's publishing. Who gets more money? Who wrote what? What are the mixes going to be like? Who, who? Everyone's trying to get their own creative stuff juices across, and everyone was creative in the band. Sam Cave, genius. Damien Gennardi, genius. Dave Walsh, genius. Andrew Black, genius. These guys are are like some of the best in the world. And Matt Hawk. Maybe I haven't talked to him in, in forever, but like me, Matt, Dave, like we did Explosion started because we were roommates. I funded the first record that J Tree put out, the demo. J, I think J Tree had to pay me back like 500 bucks to like, because I was going to put the demo out and then they got an offer from J Tree and we were like, what? J Tree wants to put this out? Fuck yeah, go for it. So the Explosion was, was supposed to be on, on Big Wheel. But yeah, th that was for them. It was for me when I listened to it, I just listened to it and think, this was a very, very great business decision for the band. You know, is it, is it commercial success? No. Is it something proud of? No. I mean, I also kind of really believe that I had a, I never said it before, so I'm trying to think out right now out loud. I believe that like the A&R part of, of my title, right, is artists and repertoire, right? And that means like literally like what songs they're playing. Right. If you go to look at Piebald, I was probably the second biggest part of Piebald besides Travis in the beginning. You know, like everything from Piebald you see now, everything that was big, I made. I mean, the logo that they have with the little lines thing, I made that myself. They're still using it today. The bus, Melvin, that was like me pushing it. I designed every record cover. I painted the fucking we're you know we are the only friends we have like the sun and the clouds and shit i cut that foam core out with my hands and painted it and hung it up in the studio that everything about that the, the frisbee that i designed the records you know what i mean everything about it, i i put them helped them with the music i got luke in the band i put i put piebald back together i got them paul coldry the guy that made the radiohead fucking records is who made our record paul coldry made our records for 10 grand he made the benz and pablo honey this dude's like should be a hundred thousand bucks to make a record with, you know, he did it. Cause like we were, and they were the weirdest band, but I like pulled that good stuff out of them. I like everything, how you said, like what's missing from black tape is all that unique, good stuff. You know, I, I emphasize the unique, good stuff. Do you know what I mean? I pushed the limits of that stuff. You know, I couldn't play drums. So I wanted to have as much input as I have. When I tried to give the explosion advice on the music or the song structure or the order, the answer was, you don't know how to fucking play guitar, so you don't get an opinion. So I was like, okay, like they would do their. I just wasn't part of the band as much, you know, and whatever. And then again, they they let me go and tried to go do something else. It was didn't even come out probably. I haven't listened to the Pieball records after the ones I did, but 
I don't think anyone else much has either. Well, I mean, even Travis said that like after we're the only friends we have, he said after that, it just didn't, he's like, we just didn't hit, you know, we didn't um, get like lightning in a bottle. That was lightning in a bottle. You know, they were like after that, they just couldn't replicate. No, that, that wasn't so. lightning in a bottle. That was, that we're not was, lightning, but like, what's the metaphor? Like, like yeah, that, but, that was like, I mean, they, to them, maybe it was, but to me, I'm creating that lightning every day. Why did you, why piebald? What was so like, what was it about them for you personally that you put so much energy into them? Um, Travis, probably Andrew. I mean, all of them. I, I was going to say, then I, then I thought of fucking, of Stuart, you know, Stuart and I were like probably best friends for like at least two weeks or something like that. Um, I don't know. I just, I, I, I saw that they were weird and unique and connected. And I liked that weird and unique stuff. And, and, you know, I mean, Grace Kelly, right. We, you guys talked about it, but like, I listened to it this morning just to like, I listened to Grace Kelly live, um, the first show I could find, and then the last show I could find, because I wanted to see what was going, like what you know, what I mean, like the progression or whatever. That that's what I was looking at today, and you know, it's like it's it's yeah, I you know, I don't know. I'm trying to think like why why you know, and Hydrahead was super close with Aaron from Hydrahead and Mark, you know, and they were like cool with us taking it over and thought it was a better fit, and and they were doing okay. But I brought them to like to like the record release where there was fucking two thousand kids and Matt Galley and fucking yeah like I, I pulled that band. Those guys were all working jobs. I like convinced them to get the band back together straight up. Like begged them to get the band back together. Did you hear the story? Because uh, Mac Rock, you said Mac Rock before, and the last time I remembered your name. Like, I mean, your name was always coming up back then when we were on, we were on tour. Like we would, we knew about Big Wheel and we knew about like, we'd always hear like Rama, Rama, Rama. We're like, man, like it was like that Amy Fiddler fucking, you know, th- those were like the labels that we felt that were, you could eventually talk to the person running the label um, or you'd run in the show, but it was still kind of like, holy shit there. They put these fucking re- releases out. But a lot, the last time I feel like I was in the same, well, only time I feel like I was in the same room as you as it was, was at Mac Rock. Cause we were there and you guys were there big wheel was there and you were there personally and this is a very roundabout way to get to the story but you said you listened to travis's interview did you hear the part where i talked about there was a party that they were at and one of them was like yeah. na- naked on a roof do, do you know anything yeah, about that story well no but, but before he said it was probably Stuart. it was i'm sure it was Stuart. Okay. you know yeah 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 Stuart. i have i have like the, i have the craziest archive by the way i'm also like a archive like uh i don't I, anyway, I, I have about 20 bins, like the big plastic, you know, thick storage bins with the lids, whatever. Yeah. I have like 20 of those full of, of Big Will and tarantula stuff, or mostly Big Will stuff. But I have a huge piebald archive, and it's like I could do a whole book of Stuart with like either nude or like um, making like some weird clothes out of duct tape or like, you know, like he had like a duct tape diaper for a while that he would just kind of wear or – you know, he, uh, yeah, he was always like flashing, whatever. Now you probably go to jail for what he was doing. But back then it was super innocent. Him just like from like a, an eighties movie almost more, you know what I mean? He'd be like flashing us, not sexual, just like, Hey guys. And you look over and his just dick would be out or whatever. You know? Yeah. Like here's the bat wings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was very sexual. Aaron was, you know, he was like, you know, very, uh, over as well, especially compared to the rest of the band members, you know, cause the band, those guys were saints. Aaron was like, I fucking play guitar. I ride a motorcycle. I bang chicks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's like, I, I said that to Travis too. There was always a rumor back in the day that the piebald guys would always get like the hottest fucking girls like all the time. And he was like, we I did. don't know about that. I was like, I think you're being modest right now, but I'm not going to. No, we it. did. I, I for sure got laid hundreds of times from piebald. Like for sure. A- every night on tour. We would go and we'd be in like, especially in Europe and stuff, you'd be like in Berlin and there'd be like a bunch of cute girls. Everyone there is good looking, by the way, like in Berlin. And you'd go like, and there'd be like a bunch of cute girls and and you'd be like, what are you girls doing after the party? And they'd be like, oh, and we wouldn't have a place to stay. Cause, you know, so we'd be, like, they'd be like, oh, well, we don't have a place to stay yet. And they'd be like, oh, come stay with us. Or I can take two of you and you two can go with my friend and blah, blah, blah. And it was like, dude, I was the, I was the selling t-shirts basically. And I got laid countless times but like if you didn't want to do it you didn't like andy had a girlfriend that he wouldn't cheat on he had no interest for it It was never like they were like again the nicest dudes but aaron was like fuck yeah travis sometimes 
you know, but, but again, those Luke, these guys are so nice. They were like, they really are as nice as they seem, you know what I mean? So. Yeah. It's like, I felt like when they were on stage, they just commanded that room and they were just like the, just oddballs on stage, but you're going like, these guys just don't give a fuck. And that's the coolest shit. So I think the confidence probably came through like crazy. Plus their songs were catchy as shit. Yeah, I think I think confidence is a hundred percent it, you know. And like, you know, I mean, there's like the the some kind of like cliche thing that like it's very simple, you know what I mean? It's like uh, we want to be rock stars, that's the thing. And, and then for a band like Pieball, like Travis talked about the the universal thing, that's the problem. It's like you got to commit to that, right? Explosion had no problem being rock stars. They were like, we we are rock stars the second we sign, not like deep down inside, but acting as if treating it like. It's supposed to be a business. Piebald probably couldn't even believe that that they could potentially do it as a job. These guys were playing Piebald. We would go in the beginning of Piebald. We would go to thrift stores, buy T-shirts for a dollar, turn them inside out, regardless of what's printed on them, and screen print the Piebald logo on in the car in the van while it's moving on the way to the next show because we could only afford to buy like ten shirts. A night we couldn't even order merch because it was like on that level you know and you and it was basements shows tons of basement shows apartments so it's probably really hard to like and i did it because i wanted to always grow and build the business right those guys did it for the art of it i was doing it for the business side of it right so for me the whole point was to grow and grow and grow and grow but i could see them being like really torn with that like the, the balance of the art and the business who wants to deal with the business shit only me because i couldn't play drums you know how many people were working for you at this time? This is like, let's say around like 99, 2000, 2001 ish time. Yeah, so probably like six people, maybe like something like that. Maybe maybe a little more. Definitely a lot of interns. Um, Aaron Power uh, worked for me, uh, who was amazing. He basically ran the label when I moved to Boston, or when I moved from Boston to Los Angeles. He really held everything down. Chris Bridge Nine worked with me uh, from Bridge Nine Records. Uh, worked with me for years while well, he was getting his label going. He was like my marketing director or whatever. Yeah, and then you know again a bunch of interns. Uh, Ryan Johnson, amazing designer, worked for me for for years. But in the beginning, it was just me, dude. I, I would uh, I'm not even joking. I would we had a loft in Boston. I lived there with the Explosion guys. I had a screen printing set up in the corner doing plastisol with fucking te- toxic fumes the whole time. And I would wake up at like eight or nine in the morning. My staff would already be there, like outside of my bedroom working in the loft where everyone else was already sleeping. No, no roofs over us, just like hearing us talk and work and pack boxes. I'd wake up, work with them from 9 a.m. to like six o'clock. They'd leave. I'd print T-shirts from six o'clock till like two or three in the morning every night. Of the week. Jesus. And I did. Besides doing everyone's shows, I did everyone's shirts. So when you're coming to Boston, I did fucking at the drive-in and Mineral and Get Up Kids and all those bands. You know, Promise Ring. When they would come, I have all the films and everything. Still, when they'd come, it would be like shit. We're, we ran out of T-shirts. Rama, can you make us some T-shirts? You know. So I had like a full time T-shirt business going for my merch, but then also I started doing every other bands merch that existed in like the scene all the hardcore bands everybody's merch wait did you print the um the boombox shirts for at the driving i didn't i didn't but I, I did print all the black tape explosion vinyl and those were hand pulled by me and it's a double-sided gatefold vinyl that i printed both sides and i think we did a couple hundred of them but it was so much work on my like uh, muscles and my shoulders that when I went to bed and I woke up in the middle of the night thinking I was like being like shocked by like electric eels or something, my 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 muscles were like shaking. It was like ah, oh, like from like a workout video, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and I had to like go like basically sit in the shower and I couldn't leave the shower for like an hour because like I was like I, like broke my arms like screen printing, but um, but yeah, I was sick of paying you know a couple extra bucks for a t-shirt. Like fuck that, you know I'm gonna like again back, back to the whole part of the thing is i'm gonna do all this shit myself now save the money was were you was like the return on this as far as financially was were you seeing like was it fulfilling to you was it was it all, was it adding up with the work you're putting in with the money that was coming no of course not no 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 of course Damn. not i make two bucks an hour you know yeah i mean come on. no no for sure that's why the 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 say anything and explosion were so interesting because i would get a check for like 
75 grand or something like at a time. Wow. You know, versus like, Damn. Yeah, like, yeah. Versus like, you know, I'm not getting any money. I'm using my own money for the bands. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And I didn't take a salary or any of that kind of stuff. And I let the bands go when I wanted to go. You know, I never, I never like held the bands. Bands, I had bands under contract for multiple records that were like, we don't think this is working out. We'd like to leave. And I'd be like, cool, go for it. Oh, wow. And like, I wouldn't even try to sell them for $5. Yeah, I didn't care about the money. My name's Rama. My mom's like a very awesome hippie lady. It's not about the, the cash. It's like about me. Like, I think at the moment, I'm still trying to figure it out exactly, but it's really like, you know, like the time that I'm spending on it and just feel like I'm investing it into doing something you know, that's, that's kind of right. Or it was like worth the investment, if you will. So to like my, my currency now, the biggest one that comes to mind probably is when I go to see like the bands play now and I see like kids singing along to songs that are 20 years old, you know, that's crazy. I, I licensed a song, a Jay June song to uh, trans world skateboarding uh, not long ago, like literally just right now, a couple of months ago. And, uh, and the kid in the video is 21 years old. And the song is 21 years old. Oh, I saw that on your, on the, yeah, the Instagram. Yeah, and it's his, it's his favorite band. And it's like, dude, what is happening? So, you know, I think people are digging through the crates more about and looking back on liner notes and doing more research on like, okay, we've listened to Jimmy World 800 times. We love him. It's our favorite band. What else was there? Where, where did it come from? What, who else played on what? Who's this guy? Who's this guy, Paul Drake? You know, Paul Drake would be a great one to get on the podcast, by the way. Paul Drake was the photographer that did all the everything for Jimmy World and everything for Rapid Drive. Oh, my God. I would. Yeah. I, this is how I get like just new people's names come up. And I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of names that oh, I knew. Paul of. Drake, dude. Yeah, yeah. Paul Drake is the man. He, he Paul Drake is the man. He's probably the one that if I if I had to pick like most influential for me, for sure, for Big Wheel would have been will be Paul Drake because like I'm talking about a list photographer. Like every cool half of the cool Discord records ads back in the day that were those print ads with the, with the, like the weird cool photo they would have and they'd have like a list of bands on the side of it and they'd have like a you know a cool artsy photo. Half of those photos are are, are Paul Drake's, and then he did Static Prevails record cover. He oh did, really? Yeah, yeah. He did uh, Clarity. So all like all the boxes on you know the stuff is it's Paul Drake and Jason Geneva Co from. From Promise Ring, but yeah, Paul Drake's the fucking man. He connected me with At The Drive-In. He was the tour manager goat, for sure. He was Jimmy Earl's tour manager. He was At The Drive-In's tour manager. And then he toured with a million bands. Yeah, just shot photos of all of them. But he was, I'm talking about, incredible photographer. So like, when it's like, cool, like your tour manager is awesome, whatever. But like, just think about how now bands hire a photographer to go out that gets paid more than the tour manager. You know, Paul was doing both. Well, if you want to and, introduce uh, me, if you want to introduce me, I'll, I'll totally. For sure. So, I mean, email any of these people. I'll connect you with anyone. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, and then, yeah, he has a book coming out. Paul Drake has a book coming out uh, with all his photos uh, pretty soon. And then uh, Amy, you know, uh, Fleischer, uh, Madden has that book coming out as well. And I gave her a bunch of photos for it. And some of those uh, photos are from Paul. I have a crazy archive, like I was saying, of all the stuff. So I had like 50 sets of slides from Paul's archive that I just had somehow. We, Paul and I were roommates in New York for a couple, maybe a year or something like that. I'm on his, I think I'm on his website right now. Photographyoncape.com. Is that him? Wait, no, that doesn't, uh, that looks like I Alex don't know. James. That doesn't look like I it. Think um, he, no, he, he did all the Christy front drive records. And like, if you just did Paul Drake, like, I don't want to use the emo word, but maybe that's one or like, Paul Drake, uh, you know, Jimmy World, you'll see like for sure, like Jimmy World just promoted like a bunch of prints of his and stuff. So let me ask you this. All right, do you still, so, cause you mentioned Clarity and we're talking about Jimmy World. Do you, do you still own, I, this probably could be the stupidest fucking question in the world, but you put out the vinyl version of Clarity. Do you still own that, the rights to that? No, no, no. Um, they, no, I mean, that's sold. No, no, Big Wheel, um, Dirk ended up, acquiring the rights to the label so he didn't buy the label from me but he licensed uh, from me the ability to reproduce any of the existing catalog so that's at the end when Pieball fired me I was like I don't want to do this anymore you know what started as a hobby in high school you know I'm now doing 12 years later or whatever and um, 
I thought I was going to do more music management stuff. So, right. So, um, and then iTunes was coming out or just was out and my interns were like, we're never buying music again. Like everything's going to be digital. The labels didn't think that they thought they, they told me that no one would stop going to record stores. So I licensed the, the rights to the, the back catalog, essentially the Dirk that's been expired for now a decade since then, since that contract's been done, but no, he would have had the rights to do that stuff, but I, I don't think he, any of it's in press or anything anymore. I don't, I don't think he makes any of that stuff. So, and Jimmy world, now that they blew the fuck up, I'm sure they took control of everything back and they own everything themselves. They, they were very smart band. Like after doing a couple records with the, the advances, when they did the DreamWorks bleed American record, with Luke Wood, you know, who now runs Beats or whatever. Oh, um, okay. You know, yeah, they did. They, they hired Mark from, you know, they did the record themselves. They paid Mark directly. And then they sold the record to DreamWorks. And then it became Bleed American, which they had to change because of, of obviously 9-11. And um, just became the self-titled, I think. But I have original copy of Bleed American before it came out. It's still unopened that they sent me. Uh, but uh, I have like both of these sent like, don't, uh, hold on, that's bad. You know, you know uh, don't, don't, don't show it to anyone. <laughs> Actually, I got the vinyl version that says Bleed American now. So yeah, they, they there you go. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's very rare. Yeah. They were just the fucking smartest dudes of all time. And the way they handled their business was, was unbelievable, you know, but again, and, and that was Zach, most of that Zach and management, of course, but, but Zach being the one to lead that, that, you know, the same way he kept the beat or the tempo of the band behind the kit. He's kind of doing that. A lot of drummers did that, though, I felt. I'm sure you saw that. Like, a lot of, there's always one person in the band that kind of, like, runs the stuff a little bit, you know? Yeah, like Vinny or Lesson J. Yeah, so, but to me, like, the drummer, a lot of times, handled handled the business. Two things, actually. One real quick. Did you watch the Jimmy World Live concerts that they did? We had to buy, they did the three albums, but they finished with Clarity, and they did Clarity all the way through. I didn't. I, I saw them. I saw them promoting it, but I didn't. No, I didn't do it. It's fucking awesome. Yeah, it was really awesome to watch. I bet. I bet. Especially during all this. Did you? So, you, 9/11. I'll ask you a couple questions. I'll let you go. Um, you said 9/11 because I would talk to J- um, to James from Fun Size and then River City High. So it was River City High at the time. So they ended up signing with you guys, and then he said that their record came out the week of 9-11 or like the day like on 9-11 or something Dude, like that we were supposed to we were supposed to fucking play i think i, I had a showcase um we we were supposed to we had i had the bands booked i believe this is correct i had the bands booked at the world trade center hotel what for the, for, what? For the day after for like 9 12 like that i think i think south or cmj was happening or something was happening in new york some kind of festival and I had some of the bands there and they were like, we were going there that week or whatever it was, but yeah, fucking so wild. Yeah. I don't remember. I don't remember the nine 11 infecting the, the records. I remember like sitting in the loft, like the, when it happened, like very clearly, but, uh, but I can't remember what was coming out at that time besides the bleed American thing, just because of the title recall. Yeah. James, if you get a chance, if you want to listen to his, I love, I love James though so much. I love him. I, I, I wrote, I made some notes of the, the people that I thought were, were interesting that we should talk about in River City, excuse me, River City High was was is on there. Yeah, they were they were so fun, such a fun band. Well, you put out you put out their first release too. You put out the the EP that they did, right? Yeah, I think yeah, I think everything with River City High was that was with Doghouse too, right? Was it Split? I believe so. I I just remember it. I remember coming out and then I saw, I was looking through Discogs and I saw they came up and I was like, oh my God, I forgot. Cause that's, that's my favorite River City High. Then they, they, with the last one, they got like super country ish and it kind of, yeah, like, for, yeah, we did Forget Your Manners too. So yeah. maybe I did the first one. Maybe I did the first one on my own. And again, back to the idea of like, you know, I don't know exactly how that happened, but it could have been something like I needed more support, quote unquote. Like I've talked about, it, I didn't like, you know, no, I should ramp the business up to become like a, a major label, basically. I didn't know I could do that. So I think it was, it was probably even in that world where they could have been like, we did the first record, but maybe Doghouse can help us because, you know, there's more money there or they own And also Doghouse bought Lumberjack Distribution at the time. So that's how we, that's how we ended up over there is, you know, we were working with, I was working with Lumberjack with um, Eric, uh, the original owner of it, the founder of it really because of him. And then when Dirk acquired it and then, you know, he made his, all, made his like kind of moves that, were like all for his benefit essentially and not really for building anything else it seemed like you know so but you know 
he got the fucking rejects there and obviously say anything there. So why we probably started working together with, with, uh, with him. It's like to, to, for him to do that, like bigger business shit. So you said you, you, you made some notes and some people that interviewed and you want to talk about, was there any like funny river city high stories that you kind of like triggered? Your brain oh, dude, oh wait, I have an amazing photo. Speaking of naked, I have an amazing photo of, James on a rope swing flying out over a lake and he's naked, but you just see him from behind. So it's just like his weird flat butt and it's like <laughs> knees are like pulled up kind of so you can't really see, but you see it's like a spiky hair. Someone in the in the pond or whatever, in the lake or whatever, like pointing up at him. And it's a fucking amazing photo. I don't know who took it, but I but I just found it randomly in, in the in the thing. But no, those guys were like they were just they were the epitome of fun. Like if like you know I worked with seventy something bands or whatever and like they pro I I can't think of someone that would have been more like fun or funny or or whatever you know and at the same time take it super serious but then they'll cover boys are back in town or whatever yeah I guess and Mark is um he's someone's um, wardrobe person uh, like Ryan what? Seacrest or something like that Mark yeah, yeah. he's like super the guitar player. yeah he does. James told me this in the interview. He's like, yeah, Mark's doing like Ryan Seacrest's wardrobes or some shit. I was like, you got to be kidding me. He's like, no, yeah, that's, that's he's like, real. it's crazy. No, he's dead serious. And I went on his, his I mean, Instagram. And he was super fashionable, but like, and I could, see, I could see him doing maybe like a country guy's thing. Maybe, well, I guess I, I just haven't seen him in 20 years. And he used to wear a cowboy hat, but. I mean, he lives out in LA, I think. He does. Oh my God, that's crazy. Well, that's right. Though, so we should, I should, I should connect with him. But yeah, they, they were a super fun band and uh, obviously really had a lot of, um, ambition to do it and and try to fit in and then you know lazy cane was another band kind of from that family that i loved uh so much you know cam you know he was in denali and and uh some other bands i'm sure as well and then who someone river city high the guitar player um why i'm playing on his name god damn it well cam not mark cam played guitar and then warren was the first one and the third one yeah, the guy, he went on to do, like, uh, a bunch of big bands here in L.A. Um, Jack's Mannequin and, like, That World, that was some of those bands. Yeah, like a ringer guitar player. But anyway, all those, everyone was, was talented in that band. You know, super talented drummer, for sure. Their, their stage presence but, uh, was hilarious. Yeah, hilarious. Hilarious. Fun. Yeah, and I saw the No Knife, you would put that the split oh, out with those guys. I loved that fucking band so much. Love No Knife. Love No Knife, for yeah. sure, for sure, for sure. That, that was an honor to get to work with, with them. They're, you know, super smart guys. Like, again, like anyone that I would listen to the music of, because I, I love music. So anyone that I'm listening to, like the Jimmy World thing, No Knife was the same thing, where I, I heard at the drive-in, the same thing, where I listen, I listen to the record like every day. And then when I met them, I was like, oh, my God. I was, like, so, like, nervous. Like, I, you know what I mean? I was like, oh, my God, no knife. Like, oh, maybe we do, like, a, a split seven inch or something. When I probably could have been like, yo, let me sign your fucking band. Fuck your other label. I'll give you the fucking tour support. And everyone would have said, like, thank God, please. Like, you know my, my songs? You know, because the major labels, like, you know, they're I, now, now I'm not working with them, right? Oh, oh, I work with these famous musicians and they're assigned to labels. So I have interactions with some of the labels, but like most of the people at the major labels are like really not talented, you know, like, I, you know, like they're, they're idiots, you know, honestly, like it's, it's, it's not shocking to me that the music industry is like in a crazy weird place because you meet most of the people that run these major labels or not run them maybe, but you know, all the people that are there and it's like, shocking how much doesn't get done or 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 is unorganized or i don't know it's it's really shocking to me but it's all i knew all i knew was music so i was like this is how business is done forever and then when i got out of it i was like holy shit this is definitely not like a good way business is done yeah i feel like the record labels the people working there either it's all i mean it's a business you know so they're thinking about money but i think their decisions are just solely based on money so it's like kind of when the explosion went over and they got like signed and everything. I feel like when you take a band that has its own thing and then, but you try to strip that away from them and to put them into the machine, that's where it just doesn't connect. Of course, of course, of course, of course. And the machine at that point was, was awful. You know what I mean? It was such a different world and it's getting better now. It seems like streaming is coming, coming through one well, I'm, I'm, right now. I'm, I'm staying at uh, my buddy's house. I, I took the last year I was in Palm Springs and just like hiding out away from COVID because my office was closed. 
uh, which was awesome. So I was renting this beautiful house at the pool out in Palm Springs, like fantasy kind of lifestyle. And then now I'm now I'm back in LA, but I'm staying at Anthony Rosamondo's house. Anthony was the guitar player for the Damn Personals, but right now he has uh, he he wrote that song "Shallow" for with Lady Gaga for "The Star Is Born." Oh wow! Uh, the Bradley Cooper movie, yeah, exactly. And he and he I put out three of his records. You know, he they they never had a commercial success. They were kind of a Strokes world kind of you know band or whatever. But Anthony went on to kind of keep putting in the work, joined a band, joined another band, joined another band, kind of kept going, like really cool bands, like the Dirty Pretty Things and, and Claxtons and these cool bands. And, and then finally, Mark Ronson and him are working on music and, and, and he, you know, shows them Shallow and they make Shallow together. Now I'm, I'm staying in like a million dollar house, multi-million dollar house in, in L.A. I'm, I'm staring at a Grammy and an Oscar from Anthony right now, you know, but I'm like, so it's like. I just feel so like, I feel like I was right. You know what I mean? Even though Anthony's band, the damn personals didn't, didn't become successful. I still feel like investing into them and into him was the right move. Cause you know, if, if I didn't do that, if, you know, if his band didn't get to go on tour and open up for Jimmy Eat world and do all these things, you know, maybe they wouldn't be, or he wouldn't be, you know, where he is, you know what I mean? He would just be stuck in Boston still doing music or whatever kind of thing. Yeah, man, it's it's a uh, it's a crazy, crazy world. What was your like criteria for signing? This is obviously going backwards, but I think it makes sense right here. Like, what was your personal criteria when you signed a band? Was it because you personally just wanted to listen to their music, or did you see that they could become like big? Um. Well, most of it was like how many how many records we can sell. Of course, you know, anything I liked, I'd put out. So I put out a band called Get High which is ironic because I was, you know, not straight edge, but all my friends were straight edge and I based, and I didn't drink or smoke when I put that record out. You know, now I love to get high, you know. It's like now, yeah, now look at you. <laughs> now, you know, now I am high. You know, then, so that, but that was uh, zero chance that was going to be commercial. That was just, it was, they were, you know, an amazing band. It was the guys from Dive and Opposition that I really respected. And yeah, and it was like, just, I just wanted to work with creative people. We'd have like, one or two, you know, artists that were bigger that would probably fund all the other small stuff. But like, I never expected to to sell lots of, of the records. I just didn't want them to be failures, you know, so we'd make them affordably. I could do a record and only sell a thousand or two of them, 2000 or something, if I didn't have to pay for recording or if it's like I'm doing the design myself and the record only cost us, CD only cost us a buck to make or whatever at the time. I think it was that, you know, personal taste. And I, I put an ad out one time that was said something like, I couldn't afford to sign Radiohead and the Beatles and like Black Sabbath or something like this, you know? So I'm giving you the damn personals and Piebald and blah, 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 you know, Cancer Conspiracy or something like that. But I just wanted to put these bands on that level. You know, I, I, like a damn personals I thought could be a, a huge rock band, but they, they, they weren't, you know what I mean? They didn't become one. And it would have been awesome to like maybe make money from that and, and or even recoup it or whatever. I probably lost money on it or something I would imagine. But, but yeah, you know, it didn't matter. I'd say that the records that like, that like were weird or whatever, the records that like didn't fit, like I got offered to do a few things that I wasn't into, but like the team was big enough at the point that other people wanted to like be bring music in and, and work with artists and add to the to the to the label, you know. So, I did a record with the guy from Shudder to Think, and I, I don't even I'm, I'm blanking on his name. That's how much I, I didn't have didn't even have much to do with it. Nathan Larson, and Nathan Larson, genius, no doubt. Record cover, record layouts, fucking beautiful. I don't even know if I listened to the record. You know, I definitely don't remember listening to it. It was a favorite artist of Aaron Power, one of the guys that, that worked for me. That was like running the, 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 the Boston headquarters essentially after I moved. So he was like, I want to do this record and I've been working with you for a long time and I love it. And I think it's a big deal. And, and we did it and I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'd be probably sold four of them or something like that. You know what I mean? It didn't, didn't, it didn't move because it was probably just not part of the world, you know, cause it wasn't just big wheel. I wasn't just signing you to the label, right? I was like putting you on tour. Every, look, look at all those fans tours. All, all the bands tore together. You know what I mean? It was a scene. You know, it was bigger than than just a label. And then when you came to Boston, 
Big Wheel presents the promise ring. I don't even have, they're not even on my label, but I'm booking hundreds of shows. Every show ever, I'm booking Joan of Arc and, and all the, the J Tree bands, every single J Tree band ever I'm booking when they're coming to Boston. Because it was better to book through me, an outside agent, pay me money to do it, but I'm gonna get the show sold out. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna make sure there's 250 kids at every show versus like the normal club that just puts it in their normal calendar and maybe like 30 people show up on a Wednesday because they like didn't really promote the show that well or whatever, you know? So it's, um, but I just did it because I loved it. I didn't, but I'd never thought it would go big. I never thought I would, like, I never thought I'd see like all of American rejects do, you know, number one shit or, or like Jimmy world do fuck in the middle. That's insane. You know, but, but I heard that record. I heard Jim played me like the acoustic version of the record right before they recorded it. And, uh, or like, you know, he, not even acoustic. And he like, you know, he played all the instruments on it or whatever. Like he recorded it at home. It sounds so different than, than the final, but yeah, I never thought that was going to ever be the case. I never thought we'd get, you know, I started it again, like as a hobby. Yeah. I still listen to Bleed American and I'm like, I, I still hear it as a Jimmy Eat World Records in the same genre as Clarity and Static Reveals. I don't get how that broke into the mainstream. Even when I see the video for them, and the video for the middle makes sense because it's like half naked people dancing around, which you're obviously going to, you know, it's going to blow up in my personal opinion. Um, yeah. Cute, yeah. Cute like hot under, chicks under, and like their underwear. I mean, sex sells. yeah. Fuck yeah. It does. As, tra- as, tra- as Travis, as Travis Shettle would say, sex sells. And unfortunately I'm buying. <laughs> Travis is amazing. I mean, dude, Travis put me in Fear and Loathing. They have a song called Fear and Loathing on Cape Cod. And it's a story about me and Travis. And like, we brought some, some girls and whatever down to Cape Cod. And we were just like taking tons of drugs, like every, anything we could have, you know, nothing, nothing, no crack or heroin, of course, but like, you know, we were like taking mushrooms and, and smoking weed. And that was crazy, you know, for us back then or whatever. So you know, it was like we're, we're, we're tripping and riding around Cape Cod on our bicycles. I, I mean, it, that was actually a crazy story. My, my bicycle turned into a giant praying mantis when I was riding it, and I had to run away from it. But that's like a whole different story. Uh, full of hallucina- hallucination of like, I, I thought I was a lizard at the same time, and I ended up having to, to wrap a uh, towel around my head as like a, with a little eye slot, like in Star Wars or something. So like no one would see my lizard face because I was like tripping so hard on mushrooms. And um, it was crazy. And I have tons of great photos of it. Ryan Johnson, the art director, photographer guy that we brought with, documented everything. And, and tra- it was me, Travis, and a couple other people, and a girl that I was seeing at the time, and, and, and some other friends or whatever. And, and Travis wrote a song about it called Fear and Loathing on Cape Cod. Uh, in it, uh, when the, he has a line that says, Rama said, I look like a Kennedy. It's like, there's like, you know, he's like, I have a photo from it and it's like, he's like sitting there with a spiked hair, like next to a boat on the ocean. And I mean, that's how much I was a part of the lives of, I mean, Jay J- June, same thing. Jay June wrote a song, you know, called 38 Calumet about our house that we all lived in with 10 yard fight and, and everybody. And, you know, they like, uh, you know, these guys, these men and women like immortalized me in their records. That's how much I was a part of it. Right. I'm not just putting out, I'm not just the record label. Like you don't hear, any other record label person being woven into the lyrics of the songs. Like, unless they rip them off maybe or something crazy and they want to get back at them. But it's like, you know, like Tony Victory or, or whoever, you know, Vagrant is not, they're not like, we, we, we love Vagrant. You know what I mean? It's like, not like that. Yeah. So that's, that's how much I was part of it again. Like, I, cause I was like so much a part of it. Like every, like, again, like every, all the art, I designed all the records. You know what I mean? Like everything. Like the first, I designed 40 or something of the records. You know, uh, Josh Hooten, incredible designer. Designed, he designed the Jimmy Earl J. June split with the big J's on it. Yeah, I love uh, that. Incredible. I can't, he was very expensive, couldn't afford him to do much other stuff. His partner, Tony Leone, did, uh, if it weren't for Nation Blinds, we curtains for us all, Piebald. Again, amazing layout, super, totally different styles. But they were very expensive. Like they were, I think they, at the time, I think they were charging me like, two thousand bucks a record or something so i was like fuck i can't i can't do that i gotta learn how to do it so i started doing all the designs of all the records everything since then i did you know all the records yeah i felt like the the break the difference between venetian blinds and then we're the only friends we have was it's venetian blinds it had it was 
I think the cover art matched the tone of that record because that record it had that piebald like happy piebald sound, but then it also had that dark piebald sound. And then after that, like we're the only friends we have, like that's when they started being more of like that was the brighter piebald era where all their artwork I felt like matched that tone going in that direction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, much better. I mean, Paul Coldry, the guy that made well, We Are the Only Friends We Have. This dude made like the most important music albums of our generation. I mean, he literally made the first two. He mixed the the first uh, first Radiohead record, and then he made the second one. You know, he called them. He called I made this one. Maybe you said like cut something out. You don't have to cut this out. But if anyone, this is one I want to see cut out. He was like, I'll do the record, and I was like, but you know, like, and then we went to a studio. I mean, there's a hundred Le- Le- Les Gibson guitars. It's like Ford Apache. It's like the nicest studio in Boston. He's like, he says something like, oh, you mean royalty head? And that's how he referred to Radiohead as royalty head. And that's how he said he could afford to make our record for, for basically no money. It's because like, you know, so like he like literally is like, you know, so I'm getting like the most famous music recording guys on the planet to do a record at a, that he's making no money from. That's how excited I am about Piebald. Do you know what I mean? And then they go to a normal label, quote unquote, who's doing that for them? No one's fighting for anyone. Come on. What are we talking about here? Are you guys cool to this day? Piebald, you'd have to ask them. I don't know. Um, I, I, I talked to, I talked to all of them, like either Instagram or phone or in person. I don't know. I mean, time heals all wounds kind of thing. That's what I say. You know, uh, I'm totally completely of, of course, cool with, 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 I think I'm cool with them. But um, I think that they feel that, you know, I, I like hindered their way to the top or something. When I look at it, like the only way they got to where they got to is because of like the countless hours of work I put in begging the band to even become a band. I think I got them to like the, the top. The reality is, you know, they, they went out and they, they played for a bunch of big labels and they're a weird, unique band. You know, Travis was a very unique front man and unique singer and stuff, you know, and they weren't like that mold of the major label thingy thing. But like, could American Hearts be a fucking, is it a hit? Yes. Could it have been a song that, that they all bought houses from? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think there's a lot of, it's hard to, to maybe deal with that, you know, but yeah, you know, but I, those guys, I mean, I've seen them all like, all separately, I'm, I'm re-releasing some music. So I'm, I did a I did a distro deal for Big Wheel three weeks ago, a month oh, ago. Wow, that's yeah. Timing. So I did I did a distro deal because I've, I've talked to all the bands in the past couple of years, and um, and then there's like you know the uh, there's Emo Night, the guys out here in ITE, um, and uh, you know I've become good friends with them, and you know, they've invited me to some of the events and I've seen, I mean, they're playing American hearts at the fucking, you know, the, the event and everyone's singing along and the band's not even there. And, you know, it's super, super awesome. And, you know, they were like kind of help kind of pushing me to like get the stuff kind of going again. So they're helping me a little bit on that or, you know, getting me inspired to kind of dig into the archives. But yeah, I basically went out and did a distro deal with like people that do like Kanye's music now and stuff like a major, Digital distro will get it on every platform. And um, I went back to all the bands and I've cut deals with them all to, to re-release essentially just digitally, nothing crazy now, but we're start putting stuff on because a lot of stuff's not even online. You know what I mean? Because the bands own it all again, right? Because we did the deal, but the bands essentially own all the music. So, so yeah, I've gone back to all of them and they just can't believe that I want to put the work into doing it. That seems like a lot of them, you know, they're like, fuck yeah, of course, let's do it. You know? So so that's what we're doing. Fast Break will be the first one. Maybe Jay June, but Fast Break, Jay June, 454 Big Block will kind of come the first three or whatever. We're figuring out the order right now. And But Luke from Piebald was the drummer of Fast Break. You know, I got him in. I begged them. They didn't want Luke at all. They were like, no, 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 no. He doesn't fit. We don't like it. But I knew that Luke was the perfect fit for Piebald. And after a while, they they, they, they like started, they were like perfect together. You know, I, you know, I was right. Again, another one that I was right about. But he played drums in Fast Break as well. So, yeah, so that's coming out. But I haven't seen Luke in years. I think I saw him at like a, a trade show. Uh, he was running a marketing agency at the time. And now he like, I think runs a drum company. 
And, uh, but he was at a trade show. I kind of walked past each other like, oh my God, weird. So I don't think, I don't think, so there's no like bad blood for sure. Like if I saw it, no one would like, there'd be no fights or something like that. But I don't know if it'd be like hugs or handshakes kind of thing, right? You know, I'm not really sure. Interesting. Well, I know that I think Travis, uh, I've seen, he'll like like some of the episodes I'll post. So he may be listening to some. So he might, I mean, he might listen. I know he li- he listened to John. I'm Cheers sure some one. people are going to listen to this. I, I'm, I'm very. Yeah, I mean, I imagine that some some of the stuff we're talking about is going to be shared with other people in the, the scene. I think it's funny because I think a lot of I think a lot of the interviews that I have, I think someone initially they're like, oh, I want to hear that story. I think sometimes they're like, ooh, I wonder if they said anything about me. <laughs> like, yeah, of course. Well, that's why that's why I listened to the Travis one to see what what he said about me. You know what I mean? So yeah, I get it. You know. Yeah, man. Um, all right. Before I ask you the last two questions, in kind of to the point where you're saying you're, you're kind of reviving it, it kind of almost answers this, but it seems like before you said where that kid added the Jay June song to a skate video. Do you see that there's potential opportunity out there with a song that you might have that's that you have you know the rights to or you know split rights with a band, and then these TikTok kids or Instagram kids who post a video like and you have like one song pop like um. Like Rob Hit from Midtown, he's got I Surrender Records, and they have this one song out by this kid, and he was like, he go. We were talking like last year. He goes, did you see that this this band that we have, his song became this TikTok like phenomenon, and it just had like millions of views or downloads or some some something crazy like that. It went fucking viral, and he's like, "This is a song that's older, or something like that." Like, do you see like there's an oppor- Do you see there's an opportunity there where there's these potential old songs that some kid or some person could put it on one of these platforms, and it could just kind of take off for like a hot minute and maybe generate like just pennies on pennies <laughs> because of this. For streaming. sure, yeah, exactly. That that's really what it is, right? Yeah, a- yeah. absolutely. Um, I mean, I think that I mean. Again, not that that I own or that I'm part of. I mean, I'd have to think now at the moment, who are we doing? I don't know. I think that's probably not realistic just because the beginning stuff, you know. But, of course, Jimmy World, you know, could be there. I know Piebald. I mean, they could do American Hearts on TikTok and it would it would crush, you know. I have, like, so many, like, blue-collar people. I have a, a an artist I managed after the label. Uh, his name uh, Cameron Bartolini. Uh, he goes by Cambo. And uh, he's an amazing p- musician and, and, and writer and uh, rapper and performer, like amazing, amazing. And um, but he has a viral hit on TikTok right now uh, called "Fancy Like," and it's like a country song that he wrote. He went to Nashville. He's like a like a hip hop. He produced Doja Cat record as well, or part of the Doja Cat record. But he went to fucking Nashville and he met this country dude. First day, first session, wrote like this monster, monster hit fancy like it's a song about it talks about applebee's in it like applebee's just licensed it and whatever but this dude's gonna buy a house from the song kind of thing but that that's really interesting to me because like now i'm like i see the power of tiktok from that kind of stuff you know or whatever obviously like you know every soldier boy song is like a tiktok right now but yeah i don't know about that stuff i think you'd need to have it be more quirky music so and i think you'd have to get like the people to spike it you know you need to get like the the stars out there to like help kick it off or something and maybe a little bit, but, but I like that. I like that. You know, the funny thing, the emo night guys were like, um, were basically saying that like they thought big wheel should have new artists. They were like, dude, there's so many artists out there right now. Yes. The old stuff. Sure. But it's all about the new stuff. They're like you, there's so many new bands. So like right now I'm just going to put out the music of the bands that like control it. And they, don't even know how to do it or whatever, like what, like, you know, publish, you know, not publishing, but play, you know, all the music stuff and the, all the codes and the, the digital fucking service provider crap. So, yeah, so I have that. We'll put all that stuff up. You never know. I mean, t-shirts for sure could be a thing. I, I imagine there'll be like shows and tour offerings. And with all that bands are active, then I could see, you know, I, I mean, I think these bands are bigger than they ever were, to be honest. Like, you know, I think that, you know, a band like Fast Break or, or even 454 Big Block is fucking amazing band that we did. And, and you know, now the, the, the singer of the band, Elgin, is like a huge, huge movie director, you know, here in Hollywood. And he does, he does the Mayans TV show, which is the, the Kurt oh, Sutter wow. uh, spinoff of the thing. Yeah, like, like if you watch Mayans, it's like directed by fucking Elgin James, written by Elgin James, you know. 
he has like, uh, you know, movies, like if you go to your Netflix right now, there's like top movies that he's written and or directed. So I could see like just fans of that, right? Or I could see music placement instead of the TikTok thing you mentioned. I could see like music placement getting out there and people just like, you know, or, or my guy Anthony from the damn personals that wrote Shallow, he has, I'm sure, a bunch of fans of just Anthony now. So like, what if his last, you know, he has three other records that we did together, like, Maybe one of those is could be used for something. Maybe someone covers one of the songs, you know, and it becomes something. I mean, that's how like um, Twenty One Pilots. I mean, they got huge. I mean, they were already getting huge, but then they did that cover. It's a kind of reverse, but they did a cover of Elvis's uh, "Can't Help Fall in Love with You," and that went fucking gangbusters on YouTube. Even though it sounds nothing like any of the music that they put out. Yeah, and look, look at even like a Johnny Cash or something. Johnny Cash was playing like 200 person rooms before Rick Rubin met with him and did that record with yeah, Hurt and everything. Hurt, yeah. I mean, legitimately, like he was playing 200 person rooms. Johnny fucking Cash. Really? You know what I mean? And then, yes. Whoa. Yes. There's an, yes. Yes. He was, he was huge. And then it, it goes from stadiums to, to, you know, this next venue down, smaller venue, smaller venue, smaller venue. And then you're Johnny Cash. You just, you're 60 years old or whatever and making up the number. You're just want to, be on the road because that's what you do and you just love to be an artist and yeah you're gonna just keep playing so yeah he was doing like 200 person rooms before rick rubin signed him and produced the record that that made him a superstar again you know um so yeah i you know there's plenty of room for for plenty of time for for any of these maybe not river city high with the songs because they were too funny and silly you know what i mean a little bit but you know a lot of the other bands you know like piebald could exist for a long time you know after listening to travis's interview with you even I was like, I was like, Piebald could play forever. Yeah, and they still play like a couple times a year before the pandemic, and they'd still do here and there. So it's like they could still show up and make a little bit of money on their name and have X amount of people show yeah, up. Yeah, just be, just play, just I mean, just play in the play in the band. You know, like it's, it's you know, you're not gonna lose money on it, but it doesn't have to be like a full time job. You know, I wish I could fucking play drums still. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you, I mean, you still have time. You're not dead yet, so you can. I have no rhythm. I'm you like, take no lesson. rhythm. I'm like, I'm like the whitest dude of all time. I have no rhythm or anything. Yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe, you're, maybe your drum playing. Well, it sounds like your drum playing. It just went into your your business sense. It's I think it's where yeah. people's creativity goes in one direction. It's I think everyone has some kind of creative thing. It's just gonna maybe it's not the thing they want, but they're like, yeah, but I, I'm good at this other thing, and you're like, you're really fucking good at that other thing. Just stay with that. And, and I and I don't really want to be on stage either. Like I'm not interested in being like like up there and recognize I'm, I'm very much want to be behind the scenes as oh, well i used to love that being oh man it was like my favorite fucking thing it's like so you just the whole it's just commanding an entire room's like um yeah i hate it it's like my vibe. nightmare oh man it's so fucking great yeah i literally like yeah it's like i'll do anything to avoid it <laughs> well cool well cool dude so uh, i'm gonna wrap this up with two questions uh i loved this entire conversation so i'm super fucking excited to i'm actually this is gonna come out next friday so uh, this coming Friday. So I'm pretty pumped with this. So one, uh, what would you like to promote? It could be anything that you're doing and or it could be something that your friends are doing or it could be both. Oh, I don't promote. I don't want to promote anything. Um, I just promote like be a good person, you know, be a good, be a good neighbor is what I would say. You know? Okay. Um, and so lastly, as you called it before, uh, what scene ethics do you hold on to to this day? Yeah, man. So, I mean, it's everything, right? Again, it's the business. It's business. Uh, it's it's everything. How I learned business. It's you know, it's the positive mental attitude, the PMA that I just mentioned on being a good neighbor. You know, um, yeah. And then it's the DIY side of this. You know, but everything is built from from the scene, for better or worse. You know, <laughs> everything is is, is is for me is built uh, from this. I, I still I still feel like I'm running a record label today. 